go. We are we are rolling. We are We're back. rolling. We're back. Welcome yeah, back to uh, Adventure It Radio, round two, Geraint. Hi there, how's it going? Yeah, good, it's going good. You know, the great thing about it is for the first 15 minutes, we were struggling not to call you Geraint <laughs> in, the, in the last episode. Are we getting it correct this time, Geraint? Geraint, Geraint Lewis. Yeah, yeah. I can't now, believe we've now I'm struggling it. with Lewis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Geraint, Geraint Lewis. Lewis. <laughs> we've Geraint got Lewis. that French thing, we just can't drop it. Yeah. <laughs> Geraint Poisson. <laughs> Definitely not French. Yeah. Yeah. Can uh, you speak any French? No. No. Well, that's pretty good, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why don't you refresh us, and for people that haven't listened to the first show, uh, Geraint, about who you are and what you do. Okay, so uh, I'm Geraint Lewis. I'm a professor of astrophysics here at the School of Physics at, mm-hmm. uh, at the University of Sydney. Uh, I am a, a lecturer, I teach physics, but I also do research into cosmology, trying mm-hmm. to understand the evolution of the universe and also what the universe is made of. So I've got a big focus on uh, you know, what, what is dark matter, mm-hmm. essentially. You know, what, what's, the, mm-hmm. what's the fundamental framework of the universe? What's dark matter? What is dark energy? And I, mm-hmm. I work in different areas to try and unravel those kind of things. So I, I work in gravitational lensing, mm-hmm. I do I build synthetic universes on computers, Easy. And, and I also do a, a work in an area called galactic cannibalism, which is where one galaxy eats another yes. galaxy. Yes. So we, we can use all of these things to basically try and test different ideas of what dark matter is. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, it's, it's a very right. broad I'm, area. I'm, I'm already aroused. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, I was aroused last one, I'm aroused again. Yeah. Yeah. This like, is like, the type of cannibalism. It's the like shit, cannibalism. Like, yeah. Uh, you Absol- can't, oh, there's nothing better than any planet. <laughs> so let's, let's just dive right into the big topic then. So talk to us about, I remember um, last time we spoke, I, I think we started off oh, with, so tell, us about, <laughs> tell us about the Big Bang, layman's terms. Now, now we don't obviously need to go over that again. Let's, let's, let's dive into dark matter. Dark because, matter. Yes. I mean, obviously, tell us, tell us all about it. What do we know? Well, we actually know quite a lot, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, th- this is the thing. We, everywhere we look in the universe, there is evidence that there is more matter than we can see uh, illuminated by stars, right? Mm-hmm. So, so when we look into the universe, we see light, we see radio waves, we see gamma rays, etc., And that comes from material, uh, you know, the same sort of stuff that we're made of, atoms, essentially. Mm -hmm. So we can actually measure how much matter is out there in terms of the stars and the gas and all that other stuff. But we can also measure the amount of matter in terms of how things are moving, right? Mm -hmm. So when you see a star orbiting in a galaxy, its orbit is held there by the mass of the galaxy. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when we calculate how much mass there is, there is 30 to 100 times more mass there than we can just see illuminated by stars right. and gas, etc. So there's all this additional matter out there. Now, it's not only, I said, in the motions of stars, but every single sort of test we do, so looking at how light waves travel through the universe, um, we see that there must be more mass there because the, the paths of those light rays get distorted. Mm-hmm. And again, what we've come to realize is that in terms of matter, the atoms, the stuff that we're made of, that is the small fraction of stuff in the universe. Mm -hmm. Everywhere we look, the evidence is from from our own galaxy to galaxies off in the distant universe to the overall framework of uh, the distribution of galaxies and clusters and everything, is there must be this extra matter out there. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is what is this stuff, right? So one thing we know is that it's not made of atoms, right? Because... Mm. Atoms radiate, right? Mm-hmm. This is the key thing, right? You know, atoms, um, e- even we radiate, right? So as human beings, we're a few hundred de- degrees Kelvin, and so we radiate in the infrared. So mm-hmm. matter radiates. Mm-hmm. And we've now looked at all bands of the electromagnetic spectrum from you know, X-rays down to radio waves, and this stuff doesn't radiate radiation. So it, it, Isn't that it, interesting? That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah, really fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So it, it's, it's not normal material. Mm. It, um, and... The sort of the leading idea is that it must be some other particle, mm. right? So it's not charged, mm-hmm. okay? Because charged particles are, interact with light; they have electromagnetic mm-hmm. radiation. It must have mass, uh, but it's got a few other properties as well um, that we sort of know. Of. It must be moving at relatively low speeds. It's not moving at like at uh, the speed of light. The big problem we have is that, um, of course, we have cosmology, but on the other side, we have particle physics, which it describes the the universe of the very small and there's no particle in there which can be the dark matter particle Mm -hmm. so in terms of all the experiments we've done at the large hadron collider Mm. etc nothing has been spat out which could represent this particle and Mm -hmm. there's nothing in the framework at the moment uh, as we understand it that could be the dark matter particle Mm -hmm. so there is a big effort both cosmologically to try and put further constraints on the properties of dark matter the way it clusters 
um, the way it's distributed and all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff. But also, we know that on the particle physics side, there's work to be done there because clearly the theory can't be complete because we know there must be at least this additional particle, which is yeah. not in that theory. Yeah. So everyone's trying to extend the standard model of particle physics such that they could find a natural candidate for the dark matter particle. Mm -hmm. um, and at the moment, um, we are we are in this this horrible situation. I'll, I'll try to explain this, right? Mm -hmm. the, the situation is, is that um, we have two highly successful theories. We have cosmology, which works really, really well. But you've got to have this dark ingredient, dark matter, mm -hmm. dark energy, for it to work. Yep. We have particle physics, which works really, really well, but we know that there has to be these extra components. Mm. And what we're looking for is places where the theories break down, because it's where they break down that tells you, look in this direction. Yep. Okay? And we don't really have that many avenues to go down. Mm. <laughs> right? So in particle physics, if every time you run the Large Hadron Collider, the stuff that comes out is exactly what your current mathematics predicts. Mm. So like you're getting it right. There's Get, just this is um this is one of the things yeah. that um, this is one of the things that I that I often think. Um, and I had this conversation with Tommy about the difference between being an atheist uh, and being agnostic. And I call myself agnostic because um, although I don't believe in gods, I feel like um, whatever created this and and how we got here and. The question I asked you, what happened before the Big Bang, all these questions, I feel like there's going to be a lot of stuff and probably, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not backing you guys in, <laughs> but I feel like surely there must be some things that we just might not be able to get our heads around. Is that what, I mean, how are we moving forward with dark matter or is it something that it's just so perplexing at the moment that you're like, what are we doing? But, but the, sorry to cut you, Grant, but the issue I have with that is that it's kind of like the... Um, it's like a gap filler. It's like whatever we don't know now, there's always a place for God. But God's been slowly sort of moved out. I mean, God yeah, I'm not even talking about a... God. I'm just talking about science, really. Like yeah. creation so, of everything, you know? So it is, it's, a, it's a very interesting question about what are the limits of human knowledge, mm. right? Because, you know, your brain, right, spent millions of years evolving mm. you to find colored fruits and then, you know, watch out for dangers on the savannah. Yeah. Wait, what about Adam and Eve? <laughs> And I think it's actually startling that this 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 brain has been able to work out as much of the universe oh. as it has. It's, I, 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 I know it, it's incredible that we've we came across this the language of mathematics, mm. uh, which we can use to describe the universe. So there's oh. all these things which um, you know. Firstly, I find rather amazing that we can even do that. But then you must ask yourself the question: Well then is it limited, right? Mm -hmm. There's only a certain number of connections in your brain. There's only a certain number of calculations that can be done. There's only a certain level of imagination, right? Mm. So will we ever be able to unravel mm. what, you know, the, the, the fundamental stuff of the universe? Will we ever be able to think about it or describe it, all that kind mm. of stuff? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I mean, mm. you know, I'm a human, and so you know, I have the same limitations. And thinking about this, you'd like to think that uh, yeah, that knowledge is one of those things which is, you know, infinitely expandable, yeah, yeah. right? But it might be that we ha we just cannot eventually yeah. solve these problems. But even yeah. if you do, like, would you necessarily want to? Isn't so much in the fun in like discovering and like it would be? It would be. Um, what's that cartoon where um, he's always Roadrunner? You yeah. know, where the things always chasing after the. Um, the chicken or the road runner, whatever it's called. It's a road runner. Road runner. Yeah. yeah. I think I said it the first time. <laughs> God, remember, I'm not, a, I'm not a physicist. Um, but if you eventually caught it, there'd be no TV show. That, that's true. That's true. But, but um, understanding the fundamental laws of the universe does not mean that there will be an end to science. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. um, because there are uh, different levels of complexity, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, the saying is, right, a bee is much more complicated than a star. Mm. Uh, how, are we ever going to be able to describe a bee in terms of fundamental physics? And the yeah. answer is, oh, quite probably, but the, the, every level that you build up, the, the complexity in the calculations mm. that you ne would need to do to ex explain mm -hmm. a bee uh, are huge. Yes. Now, so, so even if we got the fundamental laws of the universe down and we could write them all down, etc., yeah. science is not over. Yeah. In fact, science has only really just begun mm. because we then have to work out how all of that feeds through Very true. into everything Very true. else. Mm. What, about, um, what about this for, for a theory? So, so go, touching on your point of like, will we ever actually be able to get to the, the bottom of everything? And, and when we do, there's probably still a million things that we, we can't fathom. So it's basically like, and I heard this analogy 
analogy. Russell Brand used this analogy. Um, oh, once, that well-known it, scientist, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, Dr. Russell Brand, Bill. Dr. Yeah. Russell Brand. <laughs> uh, Russell Brand, PhD. Yeah. But, um, PhD. So he, he was talking about, um, does my cat know about the internet? So for example, say we have little cat biologists and astrophysicists yeah. and cat, cat scientists, like the smartest cat on the planet, because cat's just an animal, right? We're just an animal. We're part of the, part of the food chain. So like no matter how well we explained or tried to get a cat to understand that the internet exists and how it works, it'd be pretty hard for a cat's brain right now and the, the level that it's at for it to understand the internet. So are we just, can we extrapolate that out to us and say like, because I feel like that's the case. I feel like there's so much that's going on and I think we'll always c- continue moving forward in science. I feel like that's de- definitely going to be the case. Mm. But if you extrapolate that out, mm-hmm. surely there's processes that our human minds at, at the current state Enter artificial intelligence. We can talk about that if you want or not. Or not. But, but like our human brains might just not be capable of, of so, understanding. So there's a couple of points there. Uh, firstly, does, will a cat understand the internet? <laughs> I, I actually don't think a, a large fraction of people on the planet understand yes, the yeah. internet. Yes, myself I right. certainly don't. The, I mean, the, the, the language, what goes on in the computer, how that information mm. is passed back and forth, etc. Mm. It fascinates me. Right? Uh, so, do you know how a microwave works? No, oh, I know how nothing works. Well, I don't know how the, to make a coffee. <laughs> yeah, but this is this is the thing. Is but that you could learn. You yeah. could you, could a cat you, learn? That's right. You you could learn. Or yeah. Could you could, could you learn? I mean, there's plenty of people that tell you they could never understand science, right? Or yeah. mathematics is so scary. So you know, if you say to somebody, right, I will now explain to you, you know, how a microwave works. Yes, you go through the analogies, etc. And they can they can regurgitate the analogy mm. to somebody else. But do they understand how a microwave works? Mm. Do they understand how packet switching works on the mm. internet? Right? Uh, there's all these these things that we say we we uh, we say. Oh, as humans, we understand, but it's not really. It's, mm. it, the knowledge is really within the minds of. Uh, a relatively small number of people. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yes, yeah, you probably could explain everything to a, to a growing number of people. Um, but yeah, the, the question of the cat and the internet uh, depends what you mean by understand. Mm. Right? Well, I guess maybe not as a species, but as you said it yourself, there are a select group of human beings. So human beings have the potential to understand the internet. Yeah. Do cats have the potential to understand the internet? Yeah, yeah. Um, and at some level, I, w- I would guess... No. Yeah. Right. So, and you know that you know, they, they can see animals on the screen, and they think that they're there. Mm. But that's the way that that. It's uh, very immediate return. Yeah. It's very primitive. Yeah. yeah. But no, no. I, I, again, look, I don't know with regards to humans. Mm. I, I could, I could imagine that. You know, imagine one day, aliens come along and they expl- They say, "We've got this new technology that does blah," well, yeah. mm. and we could be like cats yeah. and never well, really yeah. understand. That's right. What's going on? That's totally the thing. Right. That's totally the thing. It's kind of like I find it very funny when you talk about the Voyager yeah. um, blasting off into inter- interstellar, sp- interstellar space, and we have all these ways to communicate and 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 um, try to get our message out there. But I mean, we could be we could be communicating on like a, a wavelength or a frame or a, the technology that we use that's just completely inconceivable to extraterrestrial beings and vice versa like yeah. how do we know that they understand what the internet is and, and, and recognise sound even yeah, as yeah. a form of communication well yeah and the other thing of course is, is that look our science modern science is based upon mathematics right and there's this big question of you know is mathematics discovered or is it invented right so if these mm. it, look, yes fair enough one coffee cup and one coffee cup makes two coffee cups but then well, when you hold the phone there pal <laughs> <laughs> but you know but you know what I mean is that the higher level mathematics if and again, look, this 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 is um, speculation more than anything. But if what if the aliens turn up and their science is not yeah. described by mathematics or mm. even some framework as we could even understand it? So mm. if they wanted to explain to us how their their technology worked, and we just do not have the mental no. capacity to understand how they even describe their basic yeah. science, mm. then yeah, I could imagine that we are the equivalent of cats. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's very. Thing- it, I always think of like the. Um, Obviously, if we are living in like a multiverse, for example, have you ever seen um, the final scene on Men in Black 1, I believe it is? Yep. And it's where they're, they're in New York City and then it zooms out and they're in America, zooms out, they're in North America, the uh, Earth, Milky, uh, Milky Way, yeah, you know, yeah. so on and so galaxy forth. Galaxy to galaxy. Yeah, yeah. And it, it zooms all the way out, all these stars, all these galaxies, the known universe, and then it zooms out and it's a marble that an alien, oh, uh, a, yeah. a child, alien child's playing on a, on a beach it's on some other planet so yeah. <laughs> so you know if that's if that is the case which i for one think 
and I'm, I, I, I know nothing about this. This is, but this is my theory. <laughs> I, I feel like that's got to be the case. I, I don't feel like there's an end to anything. I think everything ex- like will just just expand, and there would be many, many multiverses. This is what, like I said, as a layman, like you know, that's what I that's what I think probably is the case. Um, and if that's the case, then there's there's got to be so many processes out there that we just you know. We, but we then how is that the case? It's I mean, like what I love about physics is that. We we are we are these like physical shells in the the middle of of something infinitely large and infinitely small. Like mm. at the moment, we know that the smallest things are atoms, but only like there could be something more. Yeah, know? yeah. Like there could also be something quite big. We we just find ourselves conscious, going, "What the fuck is <laughs> yeah, going on know. right now?" But but uh, uh, yeah, so. At some level, we're limited by technology, right? Mm. So there's there's a thing, famous thing about the electron, mm-hmm. right? So uh, electrons, if you talk to people in particle physics, are point-like, right? They have no size. But if you talk about the people that do the experiments, then they, they, they do an experiment on measuring the size of the electron. There's a resolution to their experiment. And they say, okay. how, how big is an electron? And the answer always comes back smaller than your resolution, right? We'll increase the resolution. How big is an electron? Smaller than your resolution. Mm-hmm. And that's the only way that experiments work, is that you always have a finite resolution. Mm-hmm. There's no experiment that we do that says it's, it's truly point like. So we don't know really uh, you know, what an electron is mm-hmm. in terms of its size. Um, it could be that eventually we find that there's structure to the electron. Mm-hmm. This, this is why people keep pushing these experiments downwards. Mm-hmm. Similarly, with the, on the large scale, we're limited to, to the fact that uh, even if there is a multiverse, right, we only see a very small patch of this universe. Yeah. Mm. And then getting light from other patches in the, in the multiverse, yeah. we would never be able to do. So, yeah. so th- 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 there are limits to what, th- th- there are limits to the way we can probe the universe, mm. Mm. Um, which means that lots of these questions are always going to be difficult to answer. I mean, yeah. if, the, if the scale of structure in an electron is a hundred billion, trillion, trillion, trillion times smaller than the scale of our experiments mm-hmm. could ever do, mm-hmm. then we will never know mm. what's really going on in an electron, mm-hmm. right? Mm. Uh, and similarly, we're, you know, unless we can come up with some sort of um, magic at some level that can mm. get, bring us light from further um, distances in the multiverse. The back, yeah. yeah. We're never going to know what's beyond mm, yeah. the patch of universe we can see. Mm, mm. Um, and, and so, you know, at, at, at some level, there's a, there's a line there between the science we can experimentally test and then the rest of the stuff which we have to sort of um, no, hypothesize. hypothesize and think mm. about. Now, string theory is a similar one, right? String mm-hmm. theory, the wobbling strings are tiny. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We can't directly probe those um, strings at the moment. We can keep designing bigger and bigger experiments, but... You know, will we ever get down to the level to test whether or not something's a vibrating string? The answer is, at some level, no. What we have to do is f- get, uh, try and extrapolate that vibrating spring string yeah. upwards yeah. into the experimental regime we can test. And mm. at the moment, we haven't been able to do that. One of the questions I always wanted to ask was, um, so our current understanding of how old the universe is, is 13 and a half billion years? Yeah. Something like that? Yeah, a little bit older. Yeah. A little bit older. Um, and that's based on the cosmic microwave, which is the, the light that we can see, the oldest light we can see. Is that correct? Uh, it's based on a couple of things. Right. Um, so so um, uh, it's essentially to do with how fast the universe is expanding now, yep. which is this thing called the Hubble constant, which yep. is a number we can measure, yep. plus the content of the universe. Right? So the content of the universe we know is 70% dark energy, 30% yep. matter, of which most of that's dark matter. Mm-hmm. If you know what the universe is made of, right, mm-hmm. you can then um, take the expansion backwards, right? So, right? so you can take the current expansion and wind it backwards and wind it back to that mm. point where um, the size of the universe goes to zero. And right. that's how you calculate the age of the universe. Really? Yeah. But so does, this, does, dark, does dark matter um, not kind of screw that around a bit? Because that's expanding the universe, isn't it? Uh, no, dark energy. Oh, sorry, dark energy. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. causing... Expansion at a greater rate than That's it should right. be. That's, uh, no, yeah, but, but um, uh, it's the same thing. Is that if I if I uh, if I if I know how fast a car is going now, yep. right, 
And I knew that I only accelerated at a certain rate or decelerated at a certain rate to that particular point. I can work out oh, everything yes. that happened before. Okay. So that's essentially yes, what yes. we're doing. So, yes. so what the, the amount of dark matter and dark energy tell us is how much the brake has been pressed and how much the accelerator has been pressed to get us to the speed we are today. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's the way that we, we do this is that we can then – we can basically work out the path of the universe oh, in terms of that. its expansion. Okay. You can say that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so my, my question was um, – so we can we can figure out, as you said, um, how old the universe is roughly. Mm-hmm. But is that fundamentally, apart from what we just spoke about, is that fundamentally based on the fact that the light that has entered our view is that old, roughly? Because time and space. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So it 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 you can do the same thing to chart um, how long it has taken light to travel from a particular source to here today yes, yes. and this is how you calculate that you know the cosmic microwave background yes. is from around roughly 400,000 years after the big bang right, right? so we, we can age that light but the, pr- the big problem with the cosmic microwave background is that before that period yeah. the universe was was the, the, the technical phrase is optically thick which means basically it means that you're looking into a wall so you can't see a younger universe beyond that because it, you're looking at a wall because you can't see it yeah photons haven't travelled yeah yeah. yeah. Oh, well there's photons in there but they're all bouncing around and yeah. then they get to this point and they can stream straight towards you oh so something must have exploded them that way N- not quite yeah. not this is what I tell girls when I'm going out mate that <laughs> sounds really smart and you're really ruining it so uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you've got to be very careful in describing the Big Bang uh, in terms of things like explosions explosions is yes. the, explosion is the wrong word yeah right So the universe uh, uh, was born in the Big Bang, and um, if if the universe is infinite in extent now, it was infinite in extent at the Big Bang. It was born infinitely large. Okay, and what has happened in that time is after the Big Bang, uh, the universe has cooled as the universe has expanded. Which and expansion just means that the distance between objects gets bigger with time. Correct. Right. So there's no center. Right, so there's no explosion from which things. Hang on a second. So you're trying to tell us we're not the center of the universe? <laughs> yeah. No, well, that's, no, that's that's like that's 400 year old research, isn't it? No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's actually. I'm, I'm 400. I'm four or five hundred years it's, old. It's, a, it's actually it's actually better than that. He thinks cats get yeah. Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> you actually, if you you could just flip it around and just say that everywhere is the center of the universe. Mm. Right, so well, I'm, yeah, it depends I'm at on the where center, you stand. you're at the center. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, I'm great. Uh, uh, essentially, what, we, what, what the re- really the Big Bang says is that every point in the universe is equivalent. So you either you're all the center or none of you are the center. Yeah, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. We're all individuals. Yeah, right? <laughs> so, true. equal rights. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if you can imagine. Um, in the first 400,000 years, the universe was a thick fog mm-hmm. and light bounced around everywhere. And then after 400,000 years, right, it became clear. The fog dispersed and the universe became clear. And then you get the first stars forming, mm. etc. So if you imagine that that's the universe, then if you think about yourself, here we are at you know, roughly 14 billion years after the Big Bang. If we look out to nearby objects, that light has taken, you know, maybe a million years or maybe yeah. a billion years to get here. That's well after the fog. So when yeah. I look back and I see those objects, I see them as being just galaxies and stars. Mm. But eventually, if I keep looking back and looking back and looking back, I will have seen light released from the fog, which is arriving at us today. Mm. And that light released at the fog is the cosmic microwave background. That's the fog. That's the fog. So we're looking back far enough um, that we're looking back far enough in time to see the fog that was the cosmic microwave background yeah. radiation. But we don't know how far back that fog goes. Well, or we do. Uh, well, after that, it, um, so if we go back further in time, the universe must have been foggy all the way to the start. It was so dense and it was so hot. Mm. The, the, key, the key thing that, that stops the universe being a fog is when protons and electrons yep. join together to create the first hydrogen atoms. Yep. Before that point, the universe was too hot for that to happen, so it was a fog all the way before. Yep. This is why we can't see back to the Big Bang, because it, it's like trying to look through a fog bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So, uh, okay. so we, can't, we can't see that initial point. So we're, we can't see the first 400,000 years, but after that, the universe is clear, yep. and we're now starting to see stars and galaxies only a few, you know, 100,000 years after that point. Mm. Right? So that, that we're, we're actually looking back as far as we can see. Mm. Jesus. So, um, let me ask you. Um, I had something uh, 
I had something I've lost. It. <laughs> I've lost Here's it. something that I've always wanted to ask you as well, Corain. Because uh, I'm can't... freezing under the, the pressure of the first video. He's freezing under the fog. <laughs> yeah. Under the fog. Um, um, damn it! Not do, this. Do you believe? <laughs> do you um? Do you believe in God? Do I believe in God? Correct. No. Why? Why? Um. Uh, as Laplace said, mm-hmm. uh, I have no need for that hypothesis. I mean, in terms of. Uh, scientific understanding of the universe. I I don't see a place where we would need to insert uh, a a godlike being yeah. in in the sense of a c- classic religious. Oh yes, 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 yes. God. Yes. Um, there there are possibilities in terms of. Uh, something called the simulation hypothesis mm-hmm. that this universe is a simulated universe mm-hmm. that that therefore it was created by essentially a computer programmer. Is that a god? It I mean, depends on what your god is, really. Isn't it? I mean, a god is you know who who created the universe in seven days, who's got a, a white beard. No, but that's not a, that's not everybody's god, though. That's no, not. Yeah. of course not. Yeah, of course, gods are. I mean, gods well, then are what, generally how would you define god? A creator. A creator. A creator a cre- of. And that's why I call myself an atheist because. Well, an agnostic. I, 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 uh, sorry, agnostic. Because I feel like, and so, <laughs> that's so, why I so, call myself a believer. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I feel like, and interested to hear your thoughts on the on this, Grant. So, I feel like there's atheists, there's agnostics, and then there's devout religious people. There's definitely God. Praise, praise Allah. You know, Jesus Christ, whatever. Um, <laughs> I feel like there's, and don't get offended when I say this. I feel like on the science of there is a God and the science of there is no God. I feel like there is equal parts, absolutely zero, and I feel like you're crazy not to be agnostic. That's my theory, and that's only because we have all the, the science science behind the Big Bang. We have everything. Like science is great, and I believe in science, 100. percent But it still doesn't explain what put us here. Why is there consciousness? What is life? What created the universe? What was before the Big Bang? Like those questions are forever going to be. Well, they might not be, and you pulled me up on this last time. They might not be forever <laughs> unanswerable, but. Until they are unanswerable, then I feel like I feel like you're crazy to be one way or the other. That's my that's my thoughts on the whole thing. Uh, okay, so um, the question, you know, do you believe in God? Right, it's only a few words long, but what what do you mean? Yeah, uh, you know, to some people, um, a god is somebody who. Uh, you know, basically comes in and plays a part in their everyday life. And if you talk to that God through prayer, then your prayers may be answered. Okay, so you know, is there is there a being that watches over each of us? And um, you know, if if you're if you're a believer and you pray, then they will you know make sure you win the lottery or that your cat doesn't die or something. Cat gets Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> That that side, I I that's not, that's not my cup of tea. Yeah, yeah. right. No, nor nor I. Right. Yeah. Now you go one level higher. It, is there a creator in the sense of is there the possibility that uh, humans were created? Well, are we some sort of genetic experiment of some alien race? Mm-hmm. Are we? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Bacteria. I mean, it, it, Possibly, but mm-hmm. of course, you know the evolution, uh, the evidence from evolution that you know we are part of a long line of descendants that goes way back, etc., is very, very strong. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, exactly when these aliens came in and in, you know injected us with consciousness, mm-hmm. who knows? Is a chimp conscious? Conscious? Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, I, I, I don't know. I'm not an expert on chimps, but you know, you see their behavior. And often, chimps' behavior and human behavior are not that dissimilar, right? Yeah, so, especially me on a Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Jacking off, just walking uh, down the street. <laughs> uh, so, so you know, uh, could aliens have come here and put co- consciousness into apes and made made humans? I, look, it's I can't say it's one hundred percent ruled out, but I'd say the evidence against that is pretty weak. Yeah. Could we be part of a simulated universe, etc.? Well, there, there's a possibility there. There's, there's. Uh, I'm not going to say the word evidence, but the universe is consistent with it being a simulated thing. But then. Then the you know the question of do you believe in God? It's a very different God who's a computer programmer in a higher dimensional universe that created this as possibly as a sc- school uh, uh, science experiment mm-hmm. and uh, may have not even know that mm. there are living creatures <clears throat> on one of the planets in, yeah. in their simulation, etc. So you know that that. 
that this, look, this is why the philosophers wrestle with these questions. Mm. Do do you believe in God? Is not just that statement. It's a whole bucket yeah. of things. Yeah, and my my thing is is definitely not. Um, it's more as the universe and the processes behind it. Like maybe maybe there was some conscious thought something maybe it was created just creator that's the thing i'm not not a god not a whatever but that's the fact that we don't know that's where i and i don't really wrestle with it i just think there's it's an open-ended question so that's why i call myself agnostic basically and even the even the the term two things that i wanted to add with this is the term created is like you would you would have to assume then that someone planted a single-celled organism and then allowed for it to evolve because that's obviously how we've evolved. But like the word "create" just implies that we were all just planted like an Adam and Eve type. I thing, just you mean know? like uh, more the universe. Like, but but then it's the same but, question because who created the guy that created but, the universe? But it's always chicken you know? on the egg. Yeah. Right. But but uh, not to muddy the waters, right? Even muddy them. Yeah. <laughs> Get real dirty. I'm already muddy, mate. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm so confused. I'm right. dirty. I'm dirty and aroused. <laughs> okay. So. If you create the universe with the notion that eventually after 14 yes. billion years there would be humans on this planet, you've got to set up an awful lot of steps, right? Because the elements that we're cre- uh, made from were made in the hearts of stars which are now dead, mm-hmm. right? So, so essentially when you say somebody created the universe, they set up the gas mm. in such a way that it would collapse and form these stars and these stars would go through their lives and explode. This material yeah, would not get recycled. That, though. I don't even feel like that. I just feel like just... In general, like just there's some stuff. Do what you want with it. But, <laughs> okay, but you know, so that that then is an interesting question. You know, did they did the creator set up the universe with the intention that there would be life on this planet? Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Uh, because as you say, if you just set it up, I mean, th- look, it's, it, the question of life in the universe is a big one, and the question of intelligent life in the universe mm. is an equally big question. Um, but currently, all our evidence points to this being the only sort of planet with intelligent life on it if mm. not life at all yeah mm. so if you created the universe to do something and we ended up here on this planet and we are the only life that there is in the universe and you didn't set it out that way then what in what sense is that a creator exactly in mm. terms of, if, of no, no, caring about you no no you're right and i and i don't particularly believe there is a creator okay. i just know i'm just all i'm saying is i think that because it's an unanswerable at the moment not unanswerable but it's an unanswered question that's my that's my whole point. Yeah. The, the thing the with science, the thing with science is the sci- science is just, just such a beautiful um, realm because it, it's it's very modest. It always tries to prove itself wrong mm-hmm. to try to follow the evidence wherever it goes. If you if you look back, obviously, you know, um, with everything in looking for trends and things, all we do um, in any realm or industry is you look at the past. You look at where we are now, and then you try to base around future trends on those two variables. And if you look back to the time pre-modern science, all this sort of stuff, when all we had were just lovely stories and myths and theology and all these people saying lovely parables, and then you look into how the spectrum and the and, and we've changed in the timeline onto long, along to modern science, the... The place for God, and this is what I was referring to before with the the God filling gap theory, is that the place for God has become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as we've got to this stage. So if you look on, so I mean, you know, 400 years ago, we were the, was it Galileo that was imprisoned for saying that we were the, not the center of the universe anymore? Was was that Galileo or Aristotle? No, I'm going to Gal- turn. Galileo, I think. I'm Galileo? trying to remember which, which story you mean. There's a lot of... So he looked up at the universe. He, um, anyway, w- whatever it was. Yeah. But, it, I mean, but 7,000 years ago, for an example, there was an ancient civilization called the Sumerians that actually hieroglyphed or put into rocks a, co- a complete replica of our solar system, including Pluto. So they knew about Pluto, the Sumerians. It was. No, I don't think they did. You sure? <laughs> but Pretty you sure they Pluto. didn't. Do you know the Sumerians? What's your, what's your point on the Sumerians okay. and Pluto? So then? what I'm saying is, all right, back then when we were very ignorant, you know, God was a big thing. Everyone believed in God. We yeah. had to pray. We had to pray. We had to pray. The more we've come to learn, the less that sets itself as an example. So based on trends, 500 years from now, surely we're going to be looked back on this time and go, fuck, Bill, Tom and Great were so dumb. They even thought God was this. Now we know it's just clearly this. Well, uh, yeah, you, you're right that this notion of uh, it, the God of the gaps, you, know, you, you, you insert God where you think, I can't explain that, right? That's right. But, but the thing is, is that um, in reality, 
with regards to science. There's no, there's no question which is off bounds, right? There's no, there's no ultimate authority that says, we will not study this because uh, this is where we think there's a, this is where we insert God, yep. right? So consciousness, mm -hmm. right? You know, where does consciousness come from? A huge amount of research around the world to understand what consciousness is and all that kind of stuff. So science, science will, will look at, continuously look at all, um, all sort of questions with regards to the workings of the universe. Now, the way um, that some people see, see God is very different to that. God is not, the, God would never be found in the gaps because mm -hmm. that's not what God is about. God is about something that underpins the universe, not controls things on a day-to-day -day level. So again, it's it's how you define um, uh, how you define what your God does. Yep. That means whether or not you you'd be worried about uh, a particular area, you know, being a, an area where you put insert a God of the gaps. Yeah. And and look, I think one of the places that is on a losing battle are people that still try and fight from the God of the gaps, you know, the, the young earth creationists, the, oh, yeah. the, the irreducible complexity, et cetera. I mean, they're on a, on a hide into nothing at some mm. level because the, the number of, I mean, that's, it's not off, it's not um, off bounds to any scientist to go and examine these questions and ask the question, can, uh, you know, how could this bacterial structure evolve? And because mm. we know, and you know, um, when it comes to date in the earth, I think the, you know, the weight of evidence is clearly oh. on the side that it's billions of years old and not yeah. 4,000 years old. So um, the, I think the God of the gaps argument is, is doomed, but that's not how, how a lot of people see God. Yeah, true. Not I, my I, example. Yeah, I no. think you're exactly right. I think yeah. the God of the gaps and, and, and structured religion, the way that we, that we talk about it today, yes. Yes. will be no longer. For it's sure. Dropping off for sure. I totally agree. We have yeah, to be, that's not we have to be very... It's not my, my agnostic God. point. And look, yeah, I'm, yeah. A, I'm a very spiritual person mm -hmm. myself. Um, you believe in God, right? Yeah. <laughs> Man, I believe that God has a lovely beard and uh, <laughs> he's going to send me to heaven. <laughs> JC. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much a young earth correct. Shout out, shout out to the JC. <laughs> yeah, JC, Ripper. Johnny, Johnny Christos. He's probably smoking bogs up there now. <laughs> um, but, um, you look, uh, you, you, you're exactly right. We have to be very clear with our definitions. Um, and, you know, what does God mean to you, I guess, is a very good way to rebut someone asking you, do you believe in God? Um, to inform you, my, my basis of spirituality... <laughs> yeah, yeah, now I'm going yeah, yeah, to sit you down, pal. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my, the, the way um, that I see spirituality and that gives me, uh, provides me um, gratitude and hope and makes me more of a, a whole person is um, um, looking at... And I'd be, I'd be very interested to hear the, the science or your thoughts behind this from a scientific sense. Um, what I believe is that, um, and I, it's not really belief, it's just a, 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 a feeling that um, helps with my meditation and helps me become more connected to people, is that, you know, and this isn't woo-woo to say, is that we're all connected through stardust and, you know, there's, if, if, there are, if there is a finite amount of matter in the infinitely large universe, uh, then we've all come from something. Um, if that means that we were all once connected at one point um, through Stardust or whatever it was, um, then we all have a duty to, to owe to each other, a duty of care to, to respect one another because we are literally talking and interacting with people that are parts of us, you know, if we're all Stardust. Um, and what I like to believe is that, you know, universe is, um, it's not a separate entity, but if, it's, if everything in the universe is energy and flow and all that sort of thing, um, then it tries to work with itself to, 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 to balance, like negatively charged, positively charged. We all kind of attract, you know, it's that law of attraction sort of thing. And I feel like sending out positivity into the universe, into the world, based on thought and behavior and action, again, interpersonal interaction, um, you get it back. So it's like a, it's a karma thing. And, um, and um, reincarnation fits into this well, um, which I don't think is too woo-woo either because... Again, if there is a finite amount of matter in the world and people are dying and people are being born, how is this matter coming back in if, if the universe can't produce new matter? So I think it's like this lovely flow of karma and reincarnation that we're all connected. But um, I mean, reincarnation or just recycling of atoms. It's, well, but it's... Reincarnation I mean, I, is I like feel like coming like, back to life, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, I feel reincarnation is a tricky one. See, there's a lot more people now than there was in the past, right? So you're, yeah. you still need to create new people yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so even those that get reincarnated but, that, but that's still a finite amount of matter though uh, but so um, 
there's a lot of issues there. Yeah, please, uh, please. Uh, no, no, please. no, 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 no. Uh, look. I, I'm very, very interested. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So like, just, just take me to the cleaners. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, no, look. I, I, I live, I live by a slightly, uh, slightly different philosophy. Yeah. But, you know, my philosophy is, is it. For people, if if you have a feeling about the universe and the way that it works and helps you sleep at night, then mm. fine. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. That, that's for you, your internal processes, etc. Yeah. You no, know? but then uh, that that's where that stays. Yeah, yes. for sure. It's not not for sure. then for you to take that and then start to blowing up buildings. Uh, <laughs> well, not, not, not only that, but start telling people that you know you can't do this science or you can't do that science or I don't believe in the global warming stuff or I don't oh, I don't think God, no. this. Or that. You know, there's all you know. It's when you take it from there and you try and ap- apply it to other people. Yeah. Basically, I live just by the method that I ever thought that makes me feel good. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. all it is. So, uh, um. So my, my philosophy, yeah, and please. I'm sure people listening to this will sometimes say that I don't quite follow this, yeah. but my, my, my philosophy is taken from that, uh, that great uh, philosoph- philosophical writer, Douglas Adams, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> uh, when he wrote that, uh, you know, 2,000 years after a man got nailed to a tree for saying, wouldn't it be nice t- if we were nice to one another now and again, <laughs> yeah. right? God, isn't that? Yeah, that's yeah. spot on. Right, so I, I, I actually, I, I, my personal feeling is, is that people should just be nicer to yeah. one another. Now, after uh, surviving through Sydney trains for the last few days, <laughs> it's actually a pretty tough call. Yeah. But I, I think I, I think that's an important one. As you say, you talk about karma, etc. Mm. I just think people should be nice to one another. Yeah. Right? And if people are nice to one another, then yes, you you get get to see. Uh, hopefully, that society would be a, a better place. Mm. But um, yeah, the the rest of it, or the how you want to interpret the universe and how mm. you feel about the universe. So if if that makes you feel good and about and makes it lets you sleep at night mm. then that's perfectly fine mm, mm. but the problem of course with organized religion is that once everyone has these ideas yes. then they want to start saying that exactly. other people mm. should live their lives by these rules exactly yeah and that's the part i don't like the the other part that i kind of don't like as well is the is um and i, I could have just been a, a huge um i could have just been very guilty of this I'm not, I'm not actually sure with um there is a finite amount of matter in the universe is there not it's a finite amount of matter in the observable universe well yes in the in, observable universe if the universe is infinite there's an infinite amount of matter yes okay yes and so but in our observable universe which is the one that we currently live in yeah. it's fair to say that things get recycled and we we did come from stardust and yeah, yep that's yeah. true that's true but okay. uh you know not all of the um atoms in your body came from the same star and you've probably got atoms in your body uh, they came from certain stars and I've got atoms in my body and they were not the same stars. Yeah, okay. And that I had my own star. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> and and you, you actually know that because um, you're, you're a mix of elements and not the, they're not all made in, the, in, in one type of star. You need some, some medium-sized stars, and you, so heavy stars, right? Gold, yep. they're only made essentially when massive stars explode, whereas carbon that comes from uh, lower mass stars. So you need a mix of stars. And the... The hydrogen in the water that was made in the Big Bang, mm. right? So mm. you had a mix of everything that's gone in the universe up until this point, mm. which is why I said that, that if you're going to have a creator here, you know, just say I'll make a big mess of this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the fact that you end up with people here is is a pretty lucky chance, right? Mm. Well, uh, yeah, and I don't want to go back over the creator thing because I don't no. really particularly believe that that is the case. But if we are living in an infinite universe, mm-hmm. then it's not that. It, it, then every every Circumstances is happening all at the same time, right? Isn't that the whole thing between uh, uh, behind an infinite universe? Like, it, isn't a, an infinite monk? Uh, yeah, infinite, infinite monkeys. Monk, yeah, yeah. yeah. Times, like worst of times. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> that's right. You know, yes. so if, if we are in a, it's not that crazy to believe that. Yeah, look, I mean, but this is the stuff. I mean, like, there's just so many questions, and it's, yeah, it gets yeah, to the yeah. point it's where just, it's like we can go around in circles. We could go around in circles and be yeah. like, well, do we actually know a fucking thing? Yeah. Like, hey, let me let me let me let me change tack for it to right, for yeah, a sec because I've, I've got um when I um when I lost my train of thought before it was because we were talking about um the processing power of you know our human brains and mankind and what we can do in science and so forth. So I. Uh, there's two things that fascinate me right now, and I've gone off the one a little bit, the one that I'm that I'm going to bring up. But the two things are where we came from, society, evolution, human culture, and if we're doing it right or wrong. We're talking to Simon Ho shortly, mm-hmm. evolutionary biologist, and I got really fascinated. Um, I've got some really yeah. interesting stuff to bring up with him. Um, but the other thing is artificial intelligence in the future, so the past and the future of humans, basically. Um, so my question is, what are your thoughts on the fact that so obviously with our processing power of our human brains right now, we are somewhat limited. 
What are your thoughts on when we obviously get to human level artificial intelligence and then very short, shortly after that, it'll be twice as powerful as us, four times as powerful, eight times as powerful, whatever. Extrapolate that out 50 years. Artificial intelligence should be a thousand times more processing speed wise, processing power. A Exponential. More, uh, uh, yeah, that's smarter and than, than our human minds. What will happen with science when that becomes the case? Will that help scientists like yourself with their studies? Will that totally take over scientific study? Yeah, will, will, it help, will it not help at all? What are your thoughts on... Well, if we will reach artificial intelligence, if we will surpass human intelligence, and then what will that mean for science? Okay. So, uh, look, I'm, I'm a, big, uh, a big fan of, of artificial intelligence, and I have been for a long time from um, before he was even called artificial intelligence, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, back in the, the 90s. Skynet. <laughs> you know, people were using neural nets already to classify objects, etc. and I've used genetic algorithms a lot, and I, there's, a wonderful, so, so, <laughs> there's a wonderful Scientific American article, which I, every few years I pull out and I re read about uh, how um, th- this is, again, 90s, 2000s, genetic algorithms to design uh, com- components on a circuit board, right? So you basically give it a, a problem and it will try different things and design a circuit board. And, you know, it, it rapidly recreated all of the, you know, the Wheatstone Bridge and all those other circuitry things that we know about. And then it goes beyond. Mm-hmm. And it starts to design circuits that when you just present them to somebody who understands circuits, say, what does this do? They look and they go, I don't know. And I don't know how it takes this input signal and produces that output and why it's got this piece here, etc. So at some level, so, some aspects of artificial intelligence have gone yeah. beyond oh, yeah. the human yeah. mind level. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know how apocryphal this is, of course, but now computer circuits are designed by computers and yeah. we don't actually know how, quite how, how they work. Isn't that <laughs> fascinating? Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> but so, but um, the thing that I still don't know is how creative an artificial intelligence algorithm will be. I, I mean... At some level, we will work at, I think, to how to tell how to be creative. Because mm-hmm. there are lots of stories about scientific breakthroughs that, that come from dreams, right? Yeah. Some, somebody has an idea. You know, or, you know, there are famous stories about, like, um, even you know, Dirac is walking through a, a field on a Sunday or whatever. And the, this massive idea pops into his head. And where did it come from? Was it bubbling along in the background? Yeah. And did it come forward? Uh, but so, some, some ideas definitely have come to people as dreams, etc. So the question is, ca- can we codify that process? Is, is, is that process lots of things going on, chug, 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 and then spitting out the answer? Or is there something else going on? Mm. Now, um, at some level, I, th- I think we will we'll get there. We mm. will be able to um, get algorithms to assimilate huge amounts of data and come to conclusions yeah. and have creative thoughts along the lines of what that means. Mm. Well, with it, whether they will always mimic what humans do, I, I don't know. But I, I have an example. Can, can I give you an example of yeah, why I think... Mate, absolutely. Go we got you on the show. <laughs> right. So, so uh, and I hope the person involved is not listening to this. So, <laughs> so, Copyright Grant Lewis. Copyright Grant Lewis. <laughs> no, no. So, so, so the issue is, is we always go on about, uh, can we make it think like a human, mm-hmm. right? So I, re- I mentioned back in the early 90s, uh, I knew people who were working on neural nets that classify galaxies, right? And what you would do is, uh, as you do now with artificial intelligence, is you train things up. So you would you'd get all these images of galaxies, and you'd basically put them into two types. You have spiral galaxies, you know, mm-hmm. with a lovely spiral pattern, and elliptical galaxies. And so, uh, what are the elliptical ga- galaxies again? How they're they're they? th- featureless blobs. They look like oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Like, a, like a rugby ball. Yeah, um, right? yeah. Yep. Um, and so you would get a human to go through, and you'd go, right, uh, elliptical, elliptical, spiral, elliptical, elliptical, spiral, spiral, elliptical, spiral, da 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 da, da. And you'd, you'd put things into boxes. Mm-hmm. Astronomers love putting things into boxes, ellipticals and spirals. Mm-hmm. You take your neural net. You can say to your neural net, right, these are the, all the ones classed as ellipticals. These are the ones all classed as spirals. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some new images and I want you to classify them. Mm. Right? And what you would want it to do is, right, every time a new image comes in, put it in the elliptical, uh, elliptical box, put it in the spiral box, et cetera, et cetera, okay? You give it to a neural net, and the neural net comes back and says, uh, that's 0.7 elliptical, 0.3 spiral. <laughs> and you go, 
ah, so what it's done is it's found features mm. that it's, it doesn't definitively put it in one box yeah. or put it in the other. And then what you realize is that it's the human mind that's putting things in boxes. Oh, so yeah. much error in yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's what we do. We classify things. We yeah. like, love to put things in boxes. And yep. in reality, there's a continuum yes. between things. There's always a spectrum. So I think we have to be careful about demanding that uh, AI behaves like a human. Oh, yeah. What we have to understand is, is can we understand the knowledge that the AI is giving to us in yeah. terms of the way the human mind works. And it, as I said, it, you know, you, 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 uh, in medical imaging, right, mm -hmm. you want to classify things. Is that cancerous tissue, non-cancerous tissue? Mm. Um, what, I, again, I'm not an expert in this area, but, you know, maybe the definition is not as black and white as human minds would like yeah. to have it. Well, it's very, it's like when you talk about the way that we classify things, it's like Nick Bostrom's obviously paperclip theory with AI. I'm sure you would have um, heard of the theory, which is, if you said to to um, if you programmed incorrectly to a um, to an AI, the problem would be, and you said, "Hey, we want you to take this matter here, and we want you to turn it all into paperclips." And the AI is like, "Yep, cool, no worries." Programmed it wrong, and the programming said, "We want you to turn all matter into paperclips." And the AI, this is a problem with like our definitions and our oh yes, if if AI was was to go wrong, that if it was so cut and dry and we make a mistake or something like that then the AI yep. can go and turn every piece of matter on yep. earth into a, into a paperclip you know yep. which is a bunch of floating paperclips yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's obviously that, that problem of like controlling the AI and making sure that it, it thinks correctly but you're saying that we need to we need to be the ones that think correctly because the AI is going to be smarter than us yeah. so yeah. we need to be able to actually understand what is actually right, what is actually correct, and, yeah. and so forth, so, rather than the other way around. I, yeah, as I said, we're, like, we're an evolved monkey brain, mm -hmm. uh, and th this notion that the AI must be human, mm. uh, I think might, uh, might be uh, the wrong way to look at this. Yeah. Why limit ourselves? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's be more than human. Let's, yeah. Be, yeah. let's be smarter than humans, because yeah. we're not doing things. This is the thing, so, so with like, um, obviously, Elon Musk, um, Stephen Hawking, so many of these are leading minds, people that are commenting on artificial intelligence, a lot of them are talking about, Sam Harris, a good one, talking about how Nick Bostrom, the paperclip theory, how if we don't learn how to control this powerful AI, then it can come back and bite us on the ass. I feel very much like... Degrass, eh? Degrass is a positive. No, yeah, that's right. So, yeah. so um, I might have made him mention, mention him in the, wrong, in the wrong boat, but I was about to mention Neil deGrasse Tyson. So right. Neil deGrasse Tyson believes, and I, and I feel like if we can get to something that's super... Super intelligent, which is, you know, many, 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 many thousand times more intelligent than us, say in 100 years, if Moore's law and, you know, computers keep progressing the way they have in the past, mm -hmm. then surely artificial intelligence is going to be, okay, even if it can't, even if it's not conscious, even if it's not creative, even if it's not this, that and the other, if we say, here's the problem, the world is, you know, the world is getting way too hot, it's killing our ecosystems, it's killing this and that, Here's a problem. We have all this famine in the world. We can't grow crops in Africa. We can't do this and that. Here's a problem. We have cancer. We want to eradicate it. It's killing too many people. Surely we'll be able to put that into a computer and spit out, hey, here's the answer. This is AQ cancer. How come we didn't think about this? Mm. Like, is, do, you, do you believe that might be the case? Like, we might get to a point where artificial intelligence, if it has that much processing power, it will be able to like, fix all these problems? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, hang on. But the, you let's know, get around artificial intelligence. No, so, so, but 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 let's be very very careful here, right? So so, so a couple of points. Number one, um, you know, global warming. We know how to fix global warming. Mm. It's just that nobody wants to do it. Yeah. Right. So yeah. if it's going to, if 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 we run the AI and it says, look seriously, stop burning the bloody coal. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> you, <laughs> you, <laughs> why, why why didn't we? Turn your lights off, dickhead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think the more interesting one uh, could be uh, imagine that the AI spat out right. Uh, no, and I, I'll use cure cancer, but cancer, of course, there's many different kinds of diseases. But let's mm -hmm. let's just take a particular kind of cancer, cancer lung cancer. Cure lung cancer, give drug A, B, C, and give this dose of uh, radiotherapy, and uh, wait three weeks, da-da-da. And, and you do that, and it cures it, and you don't know why. Mm. Right? And the AI can't explain why, but this is the way that it does it, right? Yeah. And because it's not, not the way the doctor w would think about it. We could end up with those solutions. We could end mm. up with solutions to problems that we, at some level... Maybe with a cancer example, we can unpick, unpick it, mm. right? But with other problems, it might be, right, you will do this stuff and you will get the answer that you want. And mm. we'll be going, but 
why mm. why why do we do this that mm. and the other and mm. we we can't work it out mm. um i think that would be the interesting one because then you would have to um you would ha- have to try put, it put, you have to be brave. i mean if it's and you have to put your hands you have to put everything in the hands of these ais yeah because i mean another thing is Let's let's um, figure out, and I know we know how to, you know, reverse, not reverse, but like um, we know what we're doing to the to the environment, and we can fix a, a lot of that. But let's say we said, okay, um, lots of species becoming extinct, you know, global warming, blah blah blah. How do we fix this problem? I mean, the smartest thing for the AI to do would just be eradicate humans, and this is the obviously the the, the problem that with the doomsday Skynet or uh, you know artificial intelligence becoming conscious and having a mind of its own, or just doing the smart thing, because that's what you ask them to do, and, and taking us out of the equation. So that's, I mean, surely there's that side of it. There is that side. We have to be able to harness this power, because I heard a really cool analogy, and it might have been in this book that I read. I've only read one book on artificial intelligence. It was called Our Final Invention. Obviously, you know, once we, they get to as smart as us, then we're not going to be inventing anything anymore. Mm. They will be. Um, and the analogy was... We have to be very careful with what we're doing with artificial intelligence because effectively, it'd be like waking up humans in a jail run by mice. You know what I mean? Like, mm. if, if we create something so powerful that it's, no matter, if it has a mind of its own, if it has some sort of consciousness, if it wants to, then we're, we're out of the equation. Mm. Like, we're, we're chimpanzees. Mm. If we wanted to get rid of chimpanzees, we'd be able to do it, mm. you know? We know how to do that. We're more powerful. We're, we're smarter. We can, we can do that. It could do that to us. So how do you feel? Obviously, yeah, there is a lot of positives and you get behind that. So with the risks associated, how do you feel with the stuff that I just mentioned? Like, okay. How do you feel with the control well, factor? I, I think there's a couple of things which are important here. Num- number one is, is that um, AI is not a single thing and there's not like going to be this giant AI switch which one day goes ching, mm. Okay. AI is already being used. Yes. And it's it Where's is just iPhone? it's it's just going to grow mm-hmm. and grow and grow. Okay? So it's not a question of, you know, one day they will turn it on and we will become slaves. Mm-hmm. It will grow. Mm. Okay? We're already using it. Uh, in boiling water. Yeah. Yeah. The the other side is that that you say that you know we're in a prison, etc. Mm. What does it mean? What, what what do you mean that we're in a prison? Does it that mean that we suddenly have reached this point where we no longer have to work, and we can spend our times actually doing all this leisure stuff that they promised us we would be doing by now because of the robots? Um, <laughs> You know, more time to be creative, etc. There will be a different kind of world. Mm-hmm. I, I, I can't imagine AI is going to say that they're going to basically lock us up in cells. No, no, no. no. It's just, a, it's just an analogy for, for for creating something that's more powerful than we can control. Should it want to, should it want to go that way? That's so, so if AI becomes conscious, I believe, I agree. If that's your theory on the the more free time, more time to recover, I think that's what's going to happen. I'm a very much positive on the on the AI yeah. bandwagon. I think it's going to be great. Um, give me. If AI take all of our jobs, mm. t- say they take 30% of the jobs, uh, 50% of the jobs in the economy, then everyone just works 20 hours a week. Mm. Well, I know there's more problems to it than that, but let's just, I'll, I'll feel, feel 20 hours a week surfing, learning yeah. more Spanish, so, so picking up a guitar. Yes, you I, go, you go. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I, just, no, no, I, just, I was finished. I, I was just talking. I just, I, just, <laughs> I just going to insert something that, you know, I, I listen to a lot of economics podcasts, right? Oh, yeah. And. Uh, Nerd! <laughs> <laughs> get out. Because <laughs> suddenly you realize it's actually important. It you is. Know? When you get to my age and you have to think about what the hell superannuation is, yeah. then you yeah. better find out about this stuff. We already live in a society where people do jobs for the sake of doing jobs. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Right? Because the society is built on this thing is that you get money, you spend money, and there are zombie jobs where people basically sit there spinning their wheels. Mm. Ultimate religion, right? money. Mm. So we could already move to this model where people work less. And this is this notion of you know, universal basic income, right? Mm-hmm. That you, know, you basically give people enough money to live on. They don't need to do the zombie jobs. Yeah. Right? They can be more creative and all this kind of stuff. It's just that our economy and our world isn't built around this mm. idea. The, the idea is, is that you work, even if the work is pointless. Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to get... I think it's going to grow in terms of when we have more AI on board is either we will keep people doing zombie jobs and we know how happy people are doing their crappy office zombie jobs, Mm -hmm. right? Or we take a serious look at the way that the world works and we say, right, we have to do it differently, Mm -hmm. right? This notion of uh, capitalism based on you working, we don't need to do that. 
right? And then you can have um, people being creative and doing things, or if they want to sit on their bum all day, then they can sit on their bum all day. It doesn't mm. matter, yeah. right? This is what I love about um, exactly the point you just made, right? So Bill and I have both got through Sapiens by Yuval. Um, here it is. Here. Oh, it's uh-huh. right there. There it is. Yeah. Um, Noah Haran. Um, and what the, the one of the points that Yuval made in that book that stood out to me the most was he was talking about the evolution of agriculture and how that shaped um, Sapiens into where we are now, where we've kind of made it easier. And for everybody just listening, not watching me right now, that's in quotes, yeah, yeah. Um, easier for ourselves. And the first thing is when we tried to, we moved from a hunter-gatherer stage and we tried to grow wheat in a localized area because there would be an abundance of food and, and all this sort of stuff. And the, the best point that he made was that, um, and it's literally, it's completely true if you look at it, is that we, uh, we got all the wheat seeds. Um, I'm not sure if it's seeds, but we brought the wheat closer to where we lived. And, um, you know, that meant an abundance of food. However, in doing so, these people that were more often than not immediate return, very primitive, hunter-gatherer, now had to fend for the wheat and look after the wheat all day to protect it from birds, to make sure it didn't become a go-off and all this sort of stuff. And they became full-time farmers. So essentially, the wheat imprisoned us. Because mm. if you think about it, there they were. That wasn't easier. Yes, we have more of an abundance of food, but they have to look after it yeah, all the time. Yeah, domesticated us. Yeah, so they domesticated us. And mm. if you look at that trend, everything up until this point now, the beginning of agriculture to, to where we are now, has seemingly made our lives or has tried to make our lives easier. Every little revolution of technology will is, is, is going off the front foot of going, this will make our lives so much easier. More communication than ever, all this sort of stuff. And yet... From the trends, you hear that people are working more and more, um, people are, are more unhappy, all these luxuries like holidays and, and uh, are actually necessities and they're, they're necessary escapes because we have to do all this stuff to make sure that our life is easier. And then, I mean, like, the point you made is just, is just spot on and I just, I just find that fascinating. I can't remember I had a question with it. But, um, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll jump yeah. in there. I think um, with the... Um, rise of agriculture obviously uh, I mean we were we needed to tend to the fields and we, we needed to they say that we now work more than hunter gatherers yeah. but it also freed up a lot of people to be specialists which is where most people believe it was where really art and science came from science you know further down the line but art and science came from yeah, agriculture which is like to. yeah which is like obviously because one of the big questions for Simon evolution biologist later I want to ask him is did the agricultural fuck it for everyone yeah. you know, are we happier now you know so but yeah. but but the but the good thing is like we did get art and science really from the agricultural revolution you could you could argue so I feel like it's just the universal basic income is just the next step so here's more free time here's more free time so I think that in like say say we get to computers taking uh, artificial intelligence taking you know. 50% of our jobs, there'll also be new fields that people will work in with artificial intelligence. It's like the internet. Yeah, like yeah. horse and cart, the, in, the cars killed the horse and cart. Mm-hmm. And people worked in automotive, mm-hmm. you know? And then before, the internet killed a lot of jobs, it provided a lot of jobs. Everyone's mm-hmm. an IT guy now, you know? So there'll always be new things that'll pop up in the economy to work if you want to work. But I feel like we'll be a totally different species. We'll be more loving, more caring, more, more art, more religion, more free time, more passion, you know? Because... Um, if you gave me, if it was universal basic income, so everyone works basically 40 hours a week, you know, that's what you say, 40 hours a working week. If you said to me, all right, yeah, you've got adventure it, it's your passion, that's what you love to do, here, have the same amount of money, here's 20 hours a week. I'll go, well, do I want to put more hours into my passion project of what I love? Or do I go and, and stay at 40 hours a week? You know, what I do is creates happiness for people. It's a really positive thing. It makes me happy. So I have the choice. Or do I go and spend spend more time studying Spanish you know do I start I'm artistic I used to do art in school I used to love it but I don't do any of that because I don't have any time do I go and start an art class you know do I go and spend more time with my friends like I think it's going to be the greatest thing ever artificial intelligence I don't think it'll be doomsday like I say I mean what do I know really but outside looking in oh well you know what you know yeah yeah that's right just my general feel for the whole thing is that it's going to revolutionise revolutionise the world in well, it already Nothing has. but a positive way. It's going to keep revolutionising yeah, the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm very positive about it. Um, of course, there will be negatives. There will be downsides, as, as it is with all technologies. Uh, AI will make its way into the military as much as it will make it yeah. into the commercial world, mm-hmm. right? So there will be 
AI on the battlefield, mm. and that I find particularly uh, worrisome. Mm -hmm. You know, well, there is. I mean, drone warfare mm. is insane. Yeah, it's insane. Mm. It yeah. is. It is. Um, but uh, but overall, I mean, we, we uh, look. I'm not going to put words into the mouths of uh, people who are experts on on evolution. You mentioned that thing about you know, we started growing wheat. Uh, we became imprisoned. But at some level as well, uh, it did make our lives easier, right? Mm -hmm. I, I am, I'm 49 this year, right? If you I was 24, mate. <laughs> if I was... No, you're 49. <laughs> if I was in a you know, hunter-gatherer society, I would probably be dead by the time I'm yeah, 30. Would. Much more likely that. And mm. as a, I probably would have died before I was five. Mm. So, you know, we've talked about this imprisonment, but we have gotten a lot longer we have. life because of it mm. and because of the you know the science that came out of that we can now fly to the other side of the world yes yeah. but you're right everybody is short on time um and i actually think that that is a uh what's the right word of saying this? is it a subjective issue do you feel well look i really feel that if we really thought about it we could we could free up time i agree there are, there are, you know there are people who are employed to make paperwork for us to fill in to give them paperwork on blah de blah de blah right if you could do that and people could still live a, a, a life where they have food and shelter and enjoyment in their lives, yes. then I think that would be a good thing. I absolutely agree. I feel that like I'm I currently at this stage of my life, I'm busier than I've ever been, but it's completely filled with things that I love. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, and the, the onus is on us to make sure that we live a happy life. You know, I, I feel and I, I very much feel that capitalism, although, you know, to get back um, and speak um, um, in economics, um, capitalism, aside from the fact that it had, there's a lot of market failure, you know, there is sort of any e economic structure, but capitalism is set up to thrive if you work hard, you know, mm. and it's, it's on us to, to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, you, you, can look, you can look at the agricultural revolution and you can go, oh, you know, it's just fucked us around because we have to do this, this and this, but, uh, you know, we live in abundance right now. Absolutely. And wow. How do you do mean? we? Yeah, I we do. Totally. Wait, wait, let me jump in there then. Yeah. We are, us three sitting at the table here are the 1%. Yeah. The, the 0.5% mm. economically with what we're able to do, what we're able to buy, our quality of life. Most of the world live below the poverty line. Okay. We, uh, we no. To, we have to remember that. No, they don't. Okay, so what, so let me talk about like, let's I, say, let's say for, let's say for example, Africa. There's, why is there so much starvation in the world? when we say that, okay, we all... And, like, look at, like, Latin America. Like, Latin America, so much of it is third world, mm. living below the poverty line. And maybe I was wrong in that, that, that statement, that cut-and-dried statement. But let's say we live in abundance. We do. Capitalism works for us. So you're talking us. more about privilege, though, yeah? So, no, 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 no. But capitalism works for us. We live in abundance. But there's a huge portion of the world that lives the, in the opposite of abundance. Okay. So a couple of points. Number one, do you know Hans... Rosling, Gosling, Rosling. No. I'll have to send you his links. He has some beautiful talks on this, is that the number of people living in poverty today is a fraction of what it was in the 70s, right? Mm -hmm. The world is becoming economically more equitable, mm -hmm. right? The, the, yes, there are people in the world without food, but that is just a problem of people not bothering to send food to the people that need food. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, so worldwide, we, we are in abundance. Uh, worldwide, yeah. It's more uh, of a greed is, factor. It's quite clearly, given the gut lines of a number of people, plenty mm. of food in the world. Yeah. The point is, is that, can, can, uh, and look, here we are in Australia, I'm quibbling about how much foreign aid we want to give, mm -hmm. right? We could, we could send plenty of food overseas. Yeah, right? well, that's a good point. But, you know, it's, it's all down to people wanting to be nice to other people. Yeah, yeah. and great, I feel like. But you, you, you made the good point, Garay, that, yeah, and this is what I was going for. Um, uh, global equity has increased from yeah. before we started the agricultural it's revolution. It's just the rich, so, the rich a, getting richer and the poor getting poorer, food-wise, yeah, to yeah. a degree, is what yeah. I was saying. Yeah. But also, too, so you have to remember, within, within capitalism, that people think a lot about the 1%, and they think about who owns the majority of the world's income. But... There's no such thing as just this, this 1% barrier that everyone below can't jump into. Capitalism is based around the fact that if you work hard, you get what you want. So the 1% is constantly changing all well, the time. That is people's assets and I mean, people are growing, people are yeah, falling. Yeah. So, you know. so to jump in there though, I, I think that it's not, we aren't all born equal with the same opportunities. Like in terms I, of opportunity, correct. I, I, I've, but I that's remember a fact, it's not a belief. That, yeah, so I remember walking Everest Base Camp and on the way back down, I'd seen... Would have been the 300th, you know, pre 14 year old kid carrying 100 kilos on his back, mm. um, walking up, you know, with 
building material, mm-hmm. rice, you know, whatever, up to the top of the foot of Everest Space Camp. These kids get born into that into the Sherpa lifestyle. They're born in Nepal. They're born on one side of the, the, the boundary. Or they're born in a certain geographical area. Mm-hmm. And that's what they do for their entire life, you know? So I think working hard is great if you're in the ability to work hard and to move up in the world. These kids work as hard as... And they, they'll work that hard till they're 70 years old, mm-hmm. 80 years old, till they can't anymore, you know? So they'll work as hard as anyone on the planet mm-hmm. and they won't, they won't move up in the world. But then and, that's, different... and that's, again, it's, it's culture. It's not, it's not the kids' fault. It's not... There is still global abundance, but again, it goes back to greed, the way we've set up our structure, but, societies. And- but the reason that kid can get that work is because there's a first world person who has come there to climb a mountain. If mm. nobody bothered to climb Everest, they would be subsistence farmers with nothing, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, it, it's, uh, you might look at it and just say, okay, um, this is a very tough life. But then you have to think about if there wasn't the influence of first world people coming in, Right? Uh, would their life be better or would it be worse? Well, I, I think, it would, think, be, I think but, it would be the same. But they're, not, they're not living a good life right now with, yeah, but with the, from, with from the what economy that comes in from That's what from you Nepal. think, though. No, no. Based I'm just on your about, life? No, no, I'm just talking about... Think, they could be the happiest kid in the world. No, it that's depends right. on how you measure that's, happiness. That's right. We're, but I'm not talking about happiness. I'm talking about well, then working how do you, hard. But you're saying they don't live a good life? I'm saying they live a hard life. No matter how hard they work, they're not going to be able to... And they still live in abject poverty basically like I know all these guys I've mm-hmm. got a team of Sherpa guys in Nepal and they, they, they and they live such hard harrowing lives if they were subsistence farmers they wouldn't be probably much better off but or much worse off but they're not much better off now like okay. if you look at how hard they, and they could be very happy but they're, they're set for a very hard life okay but I you know, think no matter how hard they I work. think a hard life is a good life I actually believe that the harder you work, the, the harder I've worked and the more I've done in my life, the happier I am. And they can look at you the exact same yeah, way. Yeah, you're right, you're right. And that's yeah. right. It's, we don't really know. But there's, I've been into mines in Bolivia. I've been into La Paz is the highest capital city in the world. They have a mine called Pato- Potosi, I think it is, Potosi Mines in, mm-hmm. in Bolivia. And we did the tour of the mine. You go on blow up dynamite, whatever. But the main thing is you go into the mine and you see the conditions that these guys work in. These guys in the mines, they work, I don't know how many hours there are in a week, but they work 90 to 100 hours a week. Mm-hmm. They get one day off a month to spend with their family. They provide for their family. Every single one of them are five foot four with total hunchback, bent over. Their bodies are trash because the mines are only built for four foot and they're like five foot five. Yeah. Their bodies are humanly trash. Like, I think, and they work harder than, again, same example of working as hard as you can possibly work in your life. You can't work any harder than these guys. And they could be the happiest people on the planet. But I'm going to have a guess that they're not. Okay. That's what I'm going to... And I, I think you'd, you don't have to, but I think most people would agree with me, you know? So, so they're working as hard as you can possibly work and they're trying to get... If you could give them more money for, the, for, for working harder, they would take that money. They're, they're trying to provide for their family. And no matter how hard they work, to your point, they're not, they're not going up in the, in, the, in the ranks. They're not getting an easier life. They're not getting more money coming in. Okay. That's my point. Yeah, and that's a very fair point. And again, I, I'm literally just playing devil's advocate yeah, yeah. for the benefit of us all expanding our knowledge. But my, my thing that I would say to that, right, is that by having that job, they are providing for their family. Ignorance is always bliss. No, no one knows. We, we, we don't know. Um, we have life. We, I believe that we all three of us have good lives. We're all happy people. Mm-hmm. We're all joking, laughing, making dick dick jokes and things. Um, you got any dick jokes, Grant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, from an astrophysical sense. Yeah. Um, but um, there's things out there that we probably don't even know about that would make our lives 10 times better. I remember I watched a, a video of a guy who was a, um, he was a cacao farmer in, um, in Southern America and it was the first time he'd uh, ever... It's pronounced uh, cocaine, my friend. Yeah. No, no, cocaine, <laughs> as in for chocolate. Oh, it's a joke. Oh, mate. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, but I remember the, the first time he ever ate chocolate. And this guy seemed like a really happy guy. But the first time he had that chocolate, he had the you know, secretion of dopamine and all that sort of stuff from the sugar. And he was just like, what the fuck? But there'd be something out there that makes us 10 times happier. I think happiness is the one thing that you always have to measure someone's life by. And... Um, we're all along this path to trying to find more and more happiness. But I think um, it's also very important to try to, as best you can, step into the shoes of other people and think about what makes them happy. I remember my mum just got back from India and there was this family of like 12 people living in this room that was like like an eighth the size of this. They're all the happiest people in the world. And mm. I think that the more opportunity, the more privilege you have, 
the um, sometimes the the harder it can be to attain happiness because you have all this abundance. And I'll just use the Netflix analogy. How hard is it to fucking find something to mm. watch? Because there's so many things you can do. Yeah. Isn't it very easy no, when... No, you're right. It's and just, there's, there's the, the, they say, um, and I say they as in like studies, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that the happiest people on the planet are... They also, they also say this about Switzerland and Denmark, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. They say Vanuatu, and I've been to Vanuatu and stayed with local villagers there, and they have nothing, but they don't particularly work hard. They, they have nothing that... They have no Wi-Fi, they have no... Yeah. They, they live off the land, whatever, and they're the happiest people on the planet. I've, I've stayed with these guys. They have a smile on their face all day, every day. Couldn't be happier. Yeah. 100%. And they don't have anything that we have that we think is important and think yeah. is big houses, cars, fucking ability to fly across the planet, YouTube, iPhones. Yeah. Don't know why I said YouTube. But, um, <laughs> but um, and yeah, they're, they're happy. Uh, you know, they're, they're for sure. But yeah, I think, I, I just, I still think there's, there's people that, that unduly work hard and can't get out of, out of the... Uh, I think as, probably, as, a, as a fundamental statement... Sorry, Grant. Uh, as, as a fundamental <laughs> statement... Grant's thoughts yeah, on the He's a, he's a guess. <laughs> sorry, you can go okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, a, as a fundamental statement, I think we can all agree on that everyone is entitled to the same opportunity as everyone else. But at the same time, it's... it's, it's I disagree with that. <laughs> oh, well. I don't Every agree. human being... I, well, I think it's pretty cut and dry that every human being should be entitled to the same opportunity. Should be, for sure. As, as, I agree that they everyone. should be, but yeah. I, I don't agree that they are, just to my point. No, no, no that's race. what I'm saying. Everyone in... No, you, a, said, you said are, and then you said should be. I agree with should Oh, sorry. Be. Well, should be is, yeah, should is, be is 100% sure. what I meant. 100%. Everyone deserves the same rights yeah. and the same opportunities. But um, happiness is a different thing. Go ahead. So, again, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I will send a link to you guys to the, the talks by Hans Rosling, who, who has now died, but he's got these lovely talks about how much better the world is today in terms of uh, vaccination, access to medicine, yeah. uh, um, income, etc. The world is a better place, even though we're focused on the world going to hell in a handbasket, is a better place than it was when I was a child in the mm. 70s. Uh, one of the things I think is going to change the world is when, you know, as this all moves up, especially like uh, countries in Africa mm. and, uh, and India. And, India's uh, booming. Chi China is getting there as well. Is that there's going to be an immense amount of brain power coming online, mm. right? There already is in China and India, but you know, less so in Africa. You know, and we, we're, everyone's wondering, where's the next Einstein, etc. Mm. Now, the next Einstein is not necessarily a, you know, a, a German man. It might be a, a, currently a small girl living in a village in Africa yeah. who will go to university because the world is improving this way. Mm. And that, that's, and I am, I am. I'm very positive about the world from that side of thing when we have more people who can bring that creative side on, online. Yeah. Yeah. Because, totally agree. You know, one of the reasons that you know, white people have dominated science is because we got that little bit ahead in, in, the, in terms of the Earlier. industrial yep. revolution. Yep. The rest of the world just has to catch up. Yep, you know, for we, sure. We're, we're not intrinsically smarter. No. Right? Uh, it, the, and we will get these people coming online. And I, I am looking forward to the day when you know, we're talking about the world-class universities of, of Central Africa and yes. of, of South America. And all, they're already there, of course, yes. but more of them. Yes. Yeah. Right? And I think it will change the world. Yeah, that's a really good point. Hey, great. Um, I wanted to ask, do you, do you get much into politics? Have you seen the, the current state of um, US college campuses with things like what you just said with white privilege in that I, I look I try uh, yeah uh, look I, um, I, I'm, the one aspect of the world that disheartens me at the moment is politics yeah I think I'm not happy about politics in Australia I'm not happy about politics in the UK where I'm from yeah uh, could I be happy about politics in the US I mean I, it's, I, I, I find that one one aspect of the world which is uh, very frustrating mm. the the question about universities in the, in the U.S. Uh, and this notion of white privilege, etc., is an absolute minefield mm. because it's not simply a question about the universities. It's a question of the universities and the history mm. that that country has. Yeah. Right. And I'm not saying that Britain is being any better because it's got a long colonial history, which a lot of it is very dark, etc. But it, you can't take a university and talk about the politics going on on a university campus without taking into account uh, and the context of the history mm. of what brought um, that, that university into being and mm. the people at that university. I so, think um, the reason why I asked was because you, the, the statement you said before was um, it's not the fact that white people are smart or anything, it's the fact that we were just allowed um, better access or, or, yeah, or yeah. better... Um, 
a greater opportunity and then we advance it and it's time for everyone else to come up with. Yeah. I think there's a there's a there's a um a general leftist progressive movement of people that would probably disagree on that statement. Um, specifically from what I've seen in in on the US college campus front. But um a lot of people that would probably say it's actually that um you know, white people should should maybe check their privilege and come back down to, to give everybody else access. And um, that's why I wanted to open uh, the floor up there. Uh, I mean, I mean what, what, what do you mean by uh, check their privilege? What do you want them to do? Well, that, I mean, this is, this is why, I, I mean, I agree with you. I, I mean, we spoke about economics before and we spoke about how capitalism, again, there's a lot of things wrong with it, but the economic structure of capitalism is designed to... It's designed for incentive and it's designed to reward those that work hard, right? Yeah, yeah. Opportunities, there are different um, races and different groups and societies that have different sorts of opportunities, um, you know, and for sure. I mean, white people, as we just spoke about, um, they have probably, um, generally speaking, have been given greater opportunity um, than others. But um, a lot of people don't like capitalism because... They just say, oh, the, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And they, uh, they don't see that side of where it's like, well, if you just work really hard, you know, irrespective of the opportunity, you still may get somewhere. And I think that's, um, that's what they're all going from. Um, look, I, I said it's a minefield. Mm. My feeling is that I, I would like to think that everybody has the opportunity to go to uh, university. I think that we really have to consider um, it, so so now if you apply for a, a grant with the Australian Research Council, they want to know about your career mm -hmm. relative to opportunity yeah and I think that is a phrase that should go through everything yeah right that um, we, it must be taken into account uh, your your background at some level that you know I did not uh, and so Relative to opportunity in the ARC grants means, you know, do you have periods where you couldn't do research because you were ill or because you had a, uh, had a baby or, or other reasons that you took time out to, to explain um, why your, your CV is not as shiny as this, as this bloke who had never had a hiccup in his life, mm. right? I think that has to filter its way through the system. Mm. Mm. And, and per personally, I would, I would like to see um, more scholarships yeah. for for people to go to university, right? It's yeah. an expensive thing for you know, somebody from um, out in the sticks to come to the University of Sydney. It's not a cheap thing to do. <laughs> I would sure. love to see more scholarships. Um, and who are the people that could fund scholarships? It's the it's the very wealthy, right? That's what I would like to s think that they would do. But mm. in Australia, that's not part of the the the. The culture, but in the US it is. People mm. could do that. People tend to prefer to have buildings named after them. Mm. But you could run scholarships uh, to support people. And if there are people from disadvantaged backgrounds, etc., who didn't have the opportunities, then you should be able to provide that support. Yeah, I definitely uh, agree with that. Mm. Um, so we do have to um, get Grant out of here at some point. We got a uh, obviously, you've got a busy day. I want to get us quickly. Have you got a, a, a little bit more time? Yeah, yeah. Let's go for it. All right. So I want to just. Bring us back to um, your main field of study. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you your, and we may have covered this the first time we spoke. I don't, I don't quite remember. Um, so, what is your? If you were to say, if you were to say, all right, I believe that my my research uh, lends me to believe, or whatever. Just to have a, have a rough guess, basically, is what I'm asking. You. Do you believe we are living in a multiverse, or do you believe we are living in uh, our universe, and that's our universe? Um, I, I must side, I think, with this notion of our universe being one of many universes in the multiverse. Mm -hmm. um, as I'm, I think we did speak about last night, I wrote this book on the fact that our universe seems to have just the right kind of mix of conditions for there to mm -hmm. be complexity in life. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we spoke about, uh, that's taken by some people as evidence that there, there is a creator. Mm -hmm. But there is an, um, a natural way of, of doing that, and that's by having multiple universes, each with their own different laws of physics. Yep. And we are basically have won some sort of role of the cosmic dice to get the right laws of physics mm -hmm. for there to be complexity in life. Mm -hmm. The big problem is, that we have is that this notion of the multiverse is really just a notion. Mm. Um, there, 
there's not a rigorous scientific mathematically based theory of how a multiverse works. Mm -hmm. So there are still many, many open questions, right? And it might be that that uh, it's not a multiverse. This is the only universe. Um, but then there are other issues that need to be tackled. But I said um, my leanings are towards the fact that this is a one of many universes. Mm -hmm. It seems very weird if this is it, actually, yeah. right? Yeah. To, to me... That I always just think of what's on the... It was the same, it's the other end of the question of what happened before the Big Bang. I always think of what's on the other end of the universe. As in the end? <laughs> yeah, like, you know, it, but, but just, to, just to say, okay, if this is our universe, basically, right. you know, say, say we can contain it in a spherical ball for the sake of the, of the analogy, then what's over here? Well, well, know, so that's, the, actually, that's the thing that makes me... It's, it's, no, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. So again, it depends what you mean. Um, so... In some ideas of the universe, that beyond this ball of the stuff we can see, there's just more stuff just like it is here that mm -hmm. goes on forever. Mm -hmm. Or you might have slightly different laws of physics in various places. So mm -hmm. this is stuff Max Tegmark has written mm -hmm. about, right? So you, you could fill the, the universe with different patches of different physics. Now, in a multiverse idea is that our three dimensions will be separate to somebody else's three dimensions. So you have an infinite universe here and you have an infinite universe here, right? Mm -hmm. Which are not connected to each other. And there might be an infinite number of infinite universes mm -hmm. in the multiverse, etc. So you can, you can play this game is that you can have um, very distinct universes, not in contact with other universes that might have different laws of physics. Or this could be all there is. It could be infinitely large. There are different laws of physics out there. Um, and it's, uh, without going into too much details, there, there could be the possibility that we could explore some regions of this larger overall universe that we're in, right? So, yeah, it, it, there's a whole host of speculation and ideas about what the multiverse could be. But mm. my, I, I would say that um, the notion that we are it, that this is it, uh, makes me uncomfortable. Mm. A, a lot of it from the, this notion of fine-tuning and the fact that... Yeah, um, we're just so lucky to actually be in the position that we're in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, and my other thing that I want to just touch on before we, before we get out of here, and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, you probably know it's coming, but it's, it's, we're talking about astrophysicists here. Why don't we ask, uh, so do you believe we are the only intelligent life in the universe? All right, so... Um, it's on. Do you believe in aliens? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I've, I've actually given this a lot of thought recently. Mm -hmm. um, and the conclusion that I'm, I've come to, and talking with a lot of people about this, is that it does look like that we are the only intelligent species, uh, at least in our galaxy, if oh, not... Yeah. If not nearby and, I, and I, I'll, qu I'll quantify what, what I mean mm -hmm. by that so that sucks <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the universe about the galaxies bro yeah <laughs> the universe is 14 billion years old right the earth is four and a half billion years mm -hmm. old life on earth three and a half billion years etc but stars that could host planets that could have life have been around for a long time before our sun was born so if intelligent life was easy You'd expect there to be intelligent life in the universe, which is many millions of times, if not billions of times older than our life here, mm. right? Now, what's going to happen with that life? Well, you could imagine that it just sits on its planet, but it doesn't sound about right. You, no. you, you, like, curiosity. What? Yeah, Cur curiosity and the fact that you need more energy, right? Yes. Right? So you start to harness the energy of your star, mm -hmm. right? We would notice that. If, if a civilization arose that could harvest the energy of stars, right? Mm. What they would do is that they would take the, the starlight and it would be reprocessed into infrared. And if they could do that in one star, then they could get to the next star and do it there. So the, 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 essentially, if, if you have intelligent life that starts to explore and starts to use the energy of entire stars, then very quickly they take over a lot of stars and they start reprocessing that starlight into infrared and lower radiation. Mm. But we see starlight. Well, let me let me say say this though. But that's life so, as we know it. Hey? So 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 well, how many? Well, uh, with, well, well let, sorry, but mm -hmm. to, to tackle mm -hmm. this, what you're saying is is that uh, the life as we don't know it doesn't use energy. Well, it doesn't harness the, the energy of stars for but, their own for their own intergalactic but travel. 
but it's the most obvious energy source around, isn't I know. it? As my, we know. So, so to my to my point, so how many species since single celled organisms has has lived on planet Earth? Oh, a zillion, right? A zillion. Okay, so uh, an, just a crazy large number. As far as we're able to, you know, uh, understand, we're probably the only one species that's been able to think about or say, you know, or theor- theorise theorise about harnessing the the power of, of a star. And, I mean, intelligent as in us sitting here speaking, travelling the, the, the cosmos, whatever. Consciousness. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. Um, so, are you saying that there may be, say, for example, dinosaurs, right? Say dinosaurs. Or chimpanzees or an alligator, whatever. They're not going to be you know, travelling through space. They're not going to be harnessing the power of stars, going into other galaxies and reaching out to us, sending radio yeah. waves, whatever. But they're alive. So living... Well, you said sentient, intelligent life. I know I did, say, I know I did, but it depends on what you call intelligence again. Okay, like, sure. Like, an intelligence a sentient being that goes Conscious and lives, beings. lives in families and whatever. Like, the, okay. It's, yeah, so it's kind of, again, what are you defining? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. But my definition was kind of like, outside of like single-celled organisms and yep. sludge, Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, is there anything... Yeah. Do you still believe... So, so that, uh, that would be the case that there'd be no dinosaurs kicking around anywhere. <laughs> dinosaur so, aliens. So, so let, let, let's think about what we're saying here, right? I, I think that life, possibly as pond scum, might be common mm-hmm. throughout the universe. Single cell, very simple organisms. Mm-hmm. Now, imagine that complex organisms are common, right? So let's you can play the numbers game, right? How many potential planets there are, right? So you'd have all of these potential planets, mm-hmm. and what we're saying is is that there's complex life everywhere, but only on this one planet were the conditions right for one of the creatures to start thinking in a slightly different way. Yep. And it didn't happen on any of the other planets, thousands, millions, billions of other planets, mm-hmm. right? It only takes a couple of them to become intelligent a billion years ago and to move off their, their planet to rapidly colonize in the galaxy, mm-hmm. right? So... Uh, what we're saying is, is that what, what we would like is that the evolution of complex life is easy, but then that step to intelligence is somehow h- how hard. Yes. Mm. Right? But in fact, it seems that that part is the hard part. Yeah, but, exactly. The step is a lot easier for yeah. the next part. Mm. Yeah. That, well, why is no one else taking that step? Look, the, 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 the thing is... The, well, you, the, you see, so why, I, I, why would they I, assume that we're, we're intelligent life then? Like, why would they want to reach out to us? We're, no, no, that's assuming, that, re- that's re- assuming re- that we're, like, the fact that, the fact that we don't know, that, the fact that you believe there's no other life out there. Intelligent. Intelligent life <laughs> makes me believe that they would think that, like, why would they try to bother contacting us? Well, no, I'm not talking well, about we contact. We might be the most, uh, we may or may not be, we may, we may be the, if there are other intelligent life yeah. forms, we may be the smartest life form in the universe. Yeah, yeah but we and could we be the be, dumbest. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. We don't know. So, but my, my thing is to, to like, um, to the, um, the intelligent life theory. So, again, going back on planet Earth, so four billion years, right? And we've had all these organisms, all these species, all whatever, all the way up to us right now. So, in the, how long have we had radio waves? Uh, Since like the 1930s or something, isn't it? 100 yeah. years nearly, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so if you work out, and I'm not good, like I need a calculator, but if you go, if you go <laughs> 4 million years, uh, 4 billion years, sorry, 4 billion years divided by 100, so it's going to be 0. 0.000 whatever, that's how long we've had, we've had um, complex organisms for however long, whatever. Yep. But, that's the space of time that we've been able to send out radio waves or to go to the moon or to yeah. think about going to Mars. So, but we've had, you know, we've had humans that can communicate for a long time before they had radio waves, you know, so... Okay. Can I, can I t- t- pull things slightly to the side? Because Get in there, brother. Pe- people, you certainly can, Geraint Louis. <laughs> people mess up a few things here, right? So let's... Let, you're not uh, telling so, me that I messed up, are you? <laughs> yeah, okay. So you're talking about radio waves and you're talking about communication, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, archaeologists, right, when they go off tromping around, what do they tend to find? Bones. Bones? But Rocks. Dust. No, they're geologists. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing. What's the answer? <laughs> you f- so, you find rubbish. Yeah. Okay. Humans 
have produced rubbish mm -hmm. from the time we lived in caves. We've produced pollution, mm -hmm. okay? We have produced waste and we've produced waste heat, okay? So one of the natural things is, is that you, you produce waste. Now, if you've got a civilization in a galaxy, right? They produce waste. And I don't mean there's bits of plastic, etc. but one of the key things is, is that any civilization that occupies a large volume and is using energy equivalent to the energy of stars reprocesses that energy from starlight to infrared, right? Because that's what you do. You must produce waste, mm -hmm. okay? We don't see the signature of infrared waste from civilizations. We see starlight. People are not mm. harvesting starlight. They're not producing waste that would be obvious. So it's not a question of contact. It's the fact is that, that like the, you know, the archaeologists that find the, you know, the, the guys in um, New Zealand, when they find the, the bones of mowers that have been there, you know what's been going on. You know mm. that there was people there before. When we look out into the universe, we don't see evidence of this waste heat product mm -hmm. that would be produced by a civilization that and um, a big civilization would have to harness a huge amount of energy mm. Mm. and that's that's the signature that's missing so, so, so it's not the fact that we're looking for their i love lucy yes right it's that they we don't see the waste they produce yeah and and just to just so i'm un understanding what you're saying so say for example you took humans out of the equation on earth mm -hmm. and you just had every other living organism would they produce the same waste product that you would see if you're looking at the elements on earth from a telescope from another from another planet you actually you could work out that there's life on earth because the uh, the atmosphere is is a non equilibrium right yep. it, we should have a carbon dioxide atmosphere like mars or or Venus, we're non-equilibrium because there's there's life going on on Earth. You could you could work out the um, you could see the the waste. The sunlight is being reprocessed yeah. into infrared, right? But it's actually because the way trees work, it's actually capturing trees capture that uh, energy, right? Which is then released when it, the trees are burnt or break down, etc. Yeah. So we can see that there's that processing going on. Mm. But it would be even more extreme if you were um, trying to develop a method to capture lots of starlight. I mean, you think about it. Right? A solar panel collects sunlight, runs your refrigerator, which makes infrared. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that just essentially, that's what you would do on a giant scale. Yeah, that makes right? sense. Um, and we don't see that. Mm. And the, the startling thing is, that if you have a civilization that can travel from one star to another, and it doesn't have to travel at really high speeds, just chugging along, take a few thousand years to get to each star, Yeah. right? establish itself and then move on to the next star, harness the energy, move on to the next star. You would colonize an entire galaxy in 10 million years. Yeah. And 10 million years is nothing. Yeah. Right? On, a cosmic, on the yeah. cosmic sky. So, yeah. so if in the last few billion years there was an a, a, um, a intelligent life in our galaxy that could do this, they would have done it. This is the yeah, Fermi yeah. paradox, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what... This is, can I just yeah. ask a question then? Because that, that's just opened me up to... A, my mind's been blown. Um, but... Um, there's that age-old thing of the fact that then, um, you know, millions of millions of civilizations could have intelligent life could have existed billions of years ago, or that they they have occurred over ten billion times if you look at the sheer rate of possibility out there. But um, isn't it that so for for our solar system and then our galaxy, the conditions for for multi, for, for even single-celled organi organisms to exist have only come to fruition in the past couple of million years, or or what hundreds um, of million. Uh, for, for, for life to occur... Billion years. Billion years. Um, so l l we've had life on Earth for about three and a half billion years. Three and a half billion years. Okay. Yeah. So the conditions of our galaxy have o or our solar system have only allowed for life to occur within the last three billion years. Yes. Okay. Uh, but, but, but it's remember, what, what happened is the Earth was hot. Yes. And it, it cooled down so that you could get liquid water... And that took a while. Yep. And it was very rapidly after that that we got our first life on Earth. Yes. Does that remain constant for the rest of the universe? Or is it just our Earth? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. So then it could just be the fact that there are millions and millions of humans out there that each can't connect to each other. Like, can we see that far? But, but uh, one thing I can tell you is that if there are other Earths out there, they're not going to be the same age as this planet. Mm. Uh, they, they could be a billion years older or mm. a billion years younger. Mm. Mm. And it's the ones which are a billion years older are the ones that, that are interesting. Because if, if the process of life played out the same... For linear. Yeah. 
played out the same way there as it does here. That means that the, the intelligent life on that planet has got a billion year head start on us. Yeah. yeah. And so it they, could have, they, they to, could have become to, to, extinct. But 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 to go, but we're the only living. Yeah, that's another thing. Now you know, is, is yeah. yeah. But but the the thing with the Fermi paradox, and you talk about the fact that if there was something that was intelligent life, they wanted to get off the planet, colonize another place, ten million years. Again, I go back to the the, the thought of like there's been a zillion, a zillion, so you know if we're talking about life, we have as far as we know because we're the only planet that we know of life. We know that there's been a zillion species. Yep. And only one in a zillion have ever thought about colonizing another planet. Yeah. You know, so there could be a zillion planets with a zillion species on each planet, but we're just the one in a zillion that actually have thought about colonizing another planet. So so you know what I mean? So 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 intelligent life could be rare, right? Yeah. Truly intelligent life could be rare. And I think that's what it's pointing towards. It's tell- intelligent life is rare. I, and I actually think that that means that complex life is rare. So then that kind of makes me err on the side of um, spirituality then. Like if, if we're... <laughs> we oh. turned it religious. No, like, <laughs> you it religious. actually made me believe in Jesus Christ. <laughs> I was not ready for that. Yeah. <laughs> Reason yeah. up. Yeah. You made me believe in God. <laughs> <laughs> like, but you it, broke like, his brain with science. Yeah, yeah. You, you broke, broke my you broke brain the first religion. way. Yeah. <laughs> you made me go down. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, oh, it, it, you it, made me so smart. I'm dumb. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it might be the case. It might be, and actually, I actually see it as a as possibly a flip side to spirituality. Mm. Right? In that, if if you were going to be a creator and you're going to make this great big universe, what a bloody waste of space. Yeah, that's like, right. Put life though. on one planet. Nah, now I'm back. See, I don't. Yeah, yeah. See, I feel like there's. There's life everywhere. I yeah. don't know enough about it with the with the you know the radiation that you're talking about. I know we can see the elements that, that can predict if there's you know life on the planet, but surely there's a lot of places we can't see. And and maybe we're <laughs> yeah, just the only me, we're mean, just what, we're just what? the only people that want to go and colonize another planet. You know, yeah, surely because we're because we we're just not anthropomorphizing, anthropomorphizing basically other species on other planets to be like us. Right. So, but 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 you play the flip flip game. So you say let's pretend intelligent life is common. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, let's say that there are oh, a billion intelligent life forms in the Milky Way. Mm-hmm. You only need one of them to have that explorer feeling to them. Yeah. Only yes. one. Yes. The others can all stay at home, mm-hmm. right? Only one. So it's very uh, and it's it's um, very bad to make this argument that all aliens will do this because we know that we look at people on Earth. And we see the spread of people on Earth, right? There are explorers and there are, say, at home people in yeah. the one species. Yeah. So you need one alien in one species to say, right, let's explore. So it's, um, it's, I think it's, I don't think it's anthropomorphizing to do this. I think what it is, it, to, to try and say, oh, they must all not be like us mm. is where, where you make a yeah, so I'll jump in there. So, so your example <laughs> there. That's all, mate, without the PhD. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, no. Having a I crack. Know. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, but, like, if, if, so you said that, that if there's a billion in, in, intelligent species, it only takes one. Well, as far as we know, we're the one in a zillion. Right. You know, we're, we're literally, we're, we're we probably still break, we're, of, of what we know, yep. what's, what been, what's been on this planet. So, surely it's not, surely it's not out of the realms of possibility, I believe, because, because, like you say, a billion is a really big number. If there are a billion intelligent species, there's been more than a more than a billion intelligent. Uh, sorry, more than a billion complex organisms probably in the history of this of this planet, and only one has even thought about colonizing another planet. You know, so that's my that's my. What do you got there, man? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to work out uh, what, what the actual comment was there. Check, yeah, mate. Yeah. I mean, no, you're not religious now, are you? No, no, no. no, no. As, as, Quit as, job. Uh, 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 as okay, so there was there, there was nothing fundamentally there to stop dinosaurs becoming intelligent, mm-hmm. right? And it, uh, they, I mean they've. They had brains. Those brains could get bigger. Uh, they could have... I mean, it just took... It probably took an accident of evolution for... It would have taken an accident of evolution for there to be an intelligent dinosaurs, right? And they would have had 66 million years on us. Mm. Right? So in 66 million years for an intelligent creature, what would they do? Right? Yes, so we're the only intelligent creature on this planet, 
in that in that sense. But again, if there, even if there's zillions and zillions of other complex life out there, are you saying that nowhere in any of those was yeah. there an intelligent exactly. creature that thought about getting off? No, no, that's right. And that's the problem. I get it. I totally yeah. 100% get it. I just mean, it, I think it's not outside of the realms of possibility. If, if we're the one out of the huge number that we can't put our head of, of, of uh, multi-celled organisms basically on this, on this planet, you know, and we're, we are the only one that we believe would probably has, has done what we're what talking done. about, mm. then, you know, I'm just playing devil's advocate. It's not outside of the realms of possibility that there are you know, a zillion and we're the only ones that have gone, fuck, let's go to Mars. You know, I think you what know, we have knows? to ask then is like, what are the, the environmental conditions, if we believe, um, that allow for consciousness to evolve? Like, because if, we, if we're saying that consciousness is what makes us intelligent and, and, what, and that's what makes us explore and become curious, then like, how did that come into existence? Yeah, well, that's well a whole nother d- define consciousness. <laughs> uh, I think therefore I am. Yeah. I'm aware of myself. Well, a dolphin is aware of itself. Okay. And they split from us a long time yeah. ago. I would so say they're conscious. Yeah so, con- yeah, so consciousness evolved separately in two different animals. So then, how, so, then, so then why aren't dolphins doing what we're doing? Well, because it's very hard to make fire at the bottom of the ocean. True. And they haven't got hands. Yeah. Okay, so then, so then what would you say consciousness is defined by? I, I actually don't know. Yeah. I, I do not know. I mean, I, 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 I know what I, I mean when I say that I'm conscious, uh, but I don't... Self-aware. So, so dolphins are self-aware. Yeah. Completely 100% they self-aware. They live in families. They're, yeah. they're sad when they lose a loved one. They, yeah, they but that's cry, just like, emotional and social intelligence. How, yeah, does well, that, how do we know that that's self-awareness? Well, it's... I mean, we're not don't, saying don't that consciousness they, is 100% self-awareness. It's just... But they Look, they, they, I, from my understanding, which I, I know nothing, yeah. but they live in families, they do things together, they, they're a really smart animal, they communicate, they, yeah. you know, they feel emotions, they feel when they lose a loved one, whatever, they, they, they're, they're, they're okay. All right. tones well, and noise they make. So, I mean, they have language, okay, they have language that we don't understand, complex let's, language. Let's so that's say then, consciousness conscious. or the, all right, do dolphins have the ability to ask the big questions? Is that consciousness? Yeah. Well, maybe because it's not consciousness, I know but that's people, what I know, I know people that don't have the ability to ask true. big questions. Yeah. True. Yeah, but that, but that's a very specific thing. But but uh, just as an aside, then okay, yep. we're evolved creatures. Mm-hmm. So, uh, like the AI switch, there was no consciousness switch. Well, that's what I'm saying. Right? Did it evolve? Well, if it didn't evolve, what happened? Well, like, well, this is when spiritual. I mean. I think Joe Rogan believes that when chimps started coming down from the trees and eating psychedelic mushrooms and things, that's what helped switch consciousness to evolve. But, but, chim- but then why didn't chimpanzees and Well, that's other, exactly other, right. Yeah. Well, the, but, but the, so I, I read a book uh, recently that was, a, that was talking about, um, and again, I read a book, good on me, <laughs> but evol- evolution and, and the fact that they've done studies on, and I don't know whether it's gibbons or whatever, but there's, there's apes out there that make certain noises to, to our our ears untrained without breaking it down phonetically or whatever, or not phonetically, but like listening very closely to it, it sounds like grunts, you know, everybody's making a grunt. So there's, but there's studies that have shown that these gibbons, or again, forgive me for, make, for you know, bro sciencing this, but these gibbons, if you break it down and listen to it very, very distinct, uh, distinctly, they make slightly different calls that make the whole tribe of family of gibbons respond in the same way. Yep. So uh, with, a, with a pitch at the end yep. is... Danger from above, there's a hawk or whatever, everybody drops to the ground or everybody escapes, uh, runs away. Then if there's a snake, it's ooh, like low at mm. the end or whatever, something like that, everybody goes up a tree, all mm. the humans go up a tree. So that's, that's communication. So yeah. when we say, how did we get to this point where we're having this conversation and having an intellectual conversation, we know that at the lowest level, or not the lowest level, but at our ancestral level to chimpanzees and stuff, they are communicating. Yeah, they, yeah, are, they, sure. they do have a language and that's you know probably where we were... I don't know how long, 50 million years ago, whatever. It's, it's, it's there. The footprints of, you know, where our language came from are evident, you yep. know, so... Um, so, well, then the question is, because we also know... That <laughs> we got so many questions. Uh, oh, we got, we got, well, I'll, I'll, I'll finish got, off in this line before we do six from six. Oh, no, we've already done six from six. We, we, we need a... We do have... Um, we've got Simon in... 10 minutes, 12 minutes? Yeah, he probably knows a lot more he than probably the knows all that. Topic, But so. this uh, is one thing that we can add. Um, and then I want to... 
quickly talk about your book because I want to plug okay. that. Okay. We should do six from six too because our questions have totally changed. True. Well, we'll do, we'll do six, a quick six, six from and six. A quick, we'll do quick a book six and, six and then six from six. Okay. Yeah. Go. Um, we know that, we know that trees communicate. We know that they can send different pheromones down a line of trees to protect themselves from danger. But that's still a very primitive immediate return thing. Help escape. Like what you just said is just help escape. Mm. We're all communi- like Communication, I wouldn't say, is a clear example of intelligence. Okay, At least on, the, at least on what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. But if we're looking at, if we're looking at how, how do we communicate with extraterrestrial intelligent life form, because trees don't fucking go, want to build spaceships to go off the planet and things then, you know, are we the only species on this planet that, that, that's that, conscious? Well, I don't even know. Are like, chimps? I mean, I think this is the thing. You, 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 you have to define you, consciousness. You say, yeah. you know, do you believe in God? And you suddenly realize that that's a big yeah. question. Yeah. Same as consciousness. What is consciousness? It's a big question. Is it communication? Is it thought? Is it problem solving? Is it solving? feeling, emotion? Right? Mm. I mean, chimps definitely solve problems, but so do crows. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, there are... They, there is a, an amorphous blob here called yeah. consciousness. Mm. And again, I am not an expert. And you really should talk to somebody who is an expert <laughs> in the brain. Um, but I, I don't think it's a single, well-defined concept. Mm. Um, so I, I'm sure there are aspects of consciousness in all kinds of animals. Mm. Mm. Of what we call consciousness. Yeah, that's mm. right. So then, so then, okay, based on all of the other ones, do, would you say that we are the most advanced of all these conscious beings? And if so, why? Uh, define advanced. I mean, well, well, I mean, you've got to give me something, right? I know, no, 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 I know. I look, I, I would say that I can definitely say that we have quite human-like consciousness. I mean, then that's about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to, to know, I, we'd have to know what a dolphin is thinking or what chimp yeah. is thinking or even a that's dog right. is thinking. It's an impossible question, really. Yeah. Because we might be, our values might be our values and their values might be totally different. The fact yeah. that we can have intellectual discourse like this, the fact that we have emotions, art, whatever. So if you go and tell that to a lion, if you, if you teach a lion how to speak English and you say, hey, we do this, we do that, they're not even going to understand that no. because their field of reference is so far removed from ours. They might value different... They just, they're just different. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you have to be very careful to anthropomorphize everything into we are humans. Yeah, Everybody's yeah. evolving. We're the most evolved. We're just... We're as evolved as anybody else. Yeah. We just think through our own minds, so we make everything relate to us. And you know what I mean? And that's why we are the most destructive species. Well, because we're so ignorant in that yeah. sense. So, so can I put for a slight flip on this as well? So, you you know the mantis shrimp? No. It's, it's a little shrimp lives in the ocean, very brightly coloured, and it has a huge number of colour receptors compared to ours. Right? We've got three, mm. and I think it's got something like seven. Mm-hmm. So you know, so the the range of colours mm. and that a mantis shrimp can see, mm. it could not explain to us if it could talk what that means. It yeah. just knows that our vision, at some level, is completely. Um, Inferior. Uh, inferior. It's, right, we don't see the world as a mantis shrimp sees no. the world. I think it's similar with brains. We, we were talking about how animals are thinking and how they're deciding yeah. to do things. They, they're just different. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we're sitting here and we, we have our human consciousness. And I think it's wrong for us to think that ours is somehow a pinnacle yeah. and other animals should be trying to be like us because we don't know what goes on in their brains. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I mean. So we're the most destructive because we're eating them and they're like, we're like taking forests away the rate of like one football field a second and things and but it's I like- think that's just because and this is another this goes back to again the agricultural revolution and the fact that our species has gotten out of control and we're not part of the ecosystem yeah, but you know, no. because um, Christopher Ryan uses a good analogy his next book is called Evolved to Death and he uses the analogy of um, what uh, is it um, grasshopper becomes a locust right yeah, grasshoppers are locusts. Yeah. So, so gra- grasshoppers up to a certain point. So I think it's like, let's say, for example, use the number 150,000. 150,000 grasshoppers are, let's say, for you know, lack of a better phrase, mm-hmm. peace-loving, a peace-loving species. Mm-hmm. They go about their ecosystem. They don't, they're not destructive, whatever. They're, and then as soon as they get to a certain point, 150,000 in a certain like one kilometer, I think that's something like that, right? Once they get to that point, they turn into a different species. They turn into a species that's yeah. there's too many of them, and they turn into locusts, and they it's a plague. They they rip it. Yeah. tear everything apart in as as far as I can see. And that I think is going back to the agricultural revolution. Is it right or wrong, or did it fuck us kind of thing? That's the big one of the big questions. Like because now it's like a snowball. We're out of control. We can't you know bring back. Mm. And and that just might be. It might not be because we're conscious, because we were conscious before the agricultural revolution and we mm. weren't destructive like the way we were. I mm. mean, overhunting and stuff, they still, the jury's out on whether that was our 
doing, killing off a lot of species, and, and it's probably, yes, it was, but we weren't doing what we're doing to the planet now. Yeah. And that's because one... Well, you, you could argue that's because one little... Fork in the road where agriculture became, uh, came out. Came out, fuck. A- agriculture was... Of the closet. <laughs> yeah, a- agriculture... Agriculture. Was, agriculture started. <laughs> and then since then, it's been, you know, population, huge spike. Everything's yeah. gone out of control. And that's only because of, of that. So because we're conscious, I don't think it has anything to do with that. Mm-hmm. Um, however, we are conscious. We are, what, what you said, the most destructive. But I think that's just a bad set of scenarios, an unlucky set of scenarios that led us to where we are now we're, where we are destroying the planet to a degree mm. you know mm. yeah yeah that make, makes sense um, we have to get I, you're, about, you're about to say you're conscious of the time yeah, 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 yeah. Right, true yeah. Yeah. well I'm humanly conscious <laughs> of the yeah, time yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wonder if my cat knows what the time it is yeah. um, so, <laughs> he doesn't have a cat <laughs> um, um, do we just do a quick six from six yeah just quickly um, plug your book tell us what's about um, don't we normally do this after six from six yes we do <laughs> don't do that <laughs> Bill um, okay, so, and we're going to have to do them pretty, pretty quick fire here, Grant, but let's go with it. So, favourite travel destination, place you've been, top of the bucket list. No, no, top of your um, recommendations to anyone, favourite oh, place on the planet. Um, I like so many places. Um, look, I love London, but I'm going to mm-hmm. say the Pacific Northwest. I lived there for a couple of years, and I love the wilderness, and I love Seattle. Beautiful. Oh, very nice. Nice one. Uh, mm-hmm. Next question, dream destination, somewhere that you haven't been, top of the bucket list. Uh, Cambodia. Cambodia and Vietnam. I haven't done yeah, Southeast cool. Asia. We're doing Vietnam with Adventure Fit in uh, September, I believe. You want me to uh. slide you in a spot there, mate? <laughs> I'm teaching. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can teach us. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, my final question, any book you like to recommend to anyone? Can be a novel, can be... Um, uh, can be astrophysics. Yeah, can be you know self-written. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, w- I won't recommend my uh, give my own book for recommendations. Oh, again, there is just so many. But if anyone's got an interest in physics, they should read the Feynman lectures in physics. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, it's a bit of a textbook, but Feynman had definitely had a particular way of seeing the way the world mm-hmm. worked. Mm-hmm. It's very good. Beautiful, Tommy, you're up. Spare time. What do you do? I don't have any spare time. <laughs> <laughs> what do you like to do uh, when you, you know, when you're not working? Uh, Apart from spend time with the family. <laughs> I, I I actually like to walk and run while listening to podcasts. Oh, nice. Cool. Very Adventure good. Radio, yeah. Yeah. Very good radio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's up there. Yeah. It's probably yeah, it's up there. Definitely the best I'm podcast in the world. Never, never heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the Virgin Shit Radio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, big inspiration. Big inspiration? Yes. Someone you look up to. I'm going to guess in my head who it is. Um, ooh, inspirations. Inspirations are tough ones. Um Inspirations for why I'm doing what I'm doing? Well, yeah, it can be, but someone you just admire, someone you look up to, someone you look up to, someone you used to look up to. Well, look, I... I I'm trying to get him to say Carl Sagan, yeah. aren't you? No. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not the Carl might have been around uh, no. very famous in the, in the 90s. Yeah. He may or may not have looked up yeah. to yeah. <laughs> So one, one of the first scientists I, I knew about was Einstein because we share a birthday. Oh, really? Yeah, 40, ah. 14th of March. He was wow. born 90 years before I was. Yeah, that's awesome. Right? Yeah. So I, I share a birthday with Vulcan the Gladiator. So <laughs> shout out to Vulcan. Happy yeah. birthday for today. Yeah. Oh, my birthday today, by the way, right? Oh, happy birthday. Oh, yeah. birthday to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah thanks, yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I share a birthday with Lady yeah. Gaga. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah, yeah. same thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Albert Einstein. Okay, and then um, three people, dead or alive, to dinner. You were having a dinner, right? Who would they be and why? Um, okay, three people. Uh, Douglas Adams, because I, I loved his creativity mm-hmm. and uh, I was always a big fan of his. Um, oh, For the people uh, that don't know, Douglas Adams is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy yes. author. And Last Chance to See. Last Chance to See. Yeah, uh, and Dirk Gently, who's on Netflix. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dirk Gently. Hmm? Do it gently. No, no good do, name. Do, do, sure wasn't on that. Uh, sure wasn't on Red Shoe. Gently should be. Derek. Jesus. Are you looking up, mate? Yeah. Pornhub.com. Porn slash <laughs> Great Love. <laughs> um, oh, it's a very hard one to answer. It I is mean, tough. Yeah. Um, uh, look, Einstein... And, and Feynman, why not? I mean, mm-hmm. look, there's so many people, and yeah, there's many scientists the that you could talk so many things about. So, but Doesn't I'll go have to with be those. a scientist. I know, I know, but um, there, are, there are other people, like names you hear in, in other fields, historians and econo- uh, mm. economists, etc. 
But I think possibly the list is too long. It's tough. Yeah. It's tough. Be a big dinner. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, great. Tell us about your book in this short time we have. Okay. Uh, so book is called Fortunate Universe, Life in a Finely Tuned Cosmos uh, by myself and Luke Barnes. Uh, it's a book on the science behind the fact that the laws of physics that govern our universe uh, appear to be very fine-tuned. If the universe was born in a slightly different fashion, we wouldn't have the conditions for complexity and life in the universe. So That's awesome. Is, is it something to the similar analogy of... Uh a, uh, you know the analogy of the puddle of water in the crack in the ground? It, it's, yeah, yeah, which comes from Douglas Adams. Yes, <laughs> yeah. that's right. Yeah, so, so it is along those lines. Um, that's the anthropic re- reasoning that we, sh- you know, you have to find yourself in a universe that can support you. The question is why, you know, why is there a crack in the ground in the first place, mm. right? Oh, yeah. Without the crack, you wouldn't have the puddle. True. Right? So it's, it's that kind of question of why we have the universe that we, we do. The one where we could be sitting in this uh, uh, sitting here asking these kind of questions. Mm. I love it. Cool. Well, round two, that was fascinating. Yeah, it was so good. <laughs> we'll get you for round three as well. Thanks so much, yeah. Ryan. Um, we'll be, a lot, we'll a be more conscious by that stage. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. And uh, yeah, that's a wrap.